Hello and welcome back to the e-commerce store. This is part two. So if you haven't already looked at part one, then maybe you might want to consider having a look at part one first. Now, just to give you a quick recap on what we did in the first component of this tutorial series or this project is we built a simple setup application. So I've taken you through how to start a Django application, set up the URLs and views and models, working with media, and then of course, testing the views and models. So what we ended up with in the previous tutorial was a similar application that looks like this. We had the homepage where we had all of our products that we've added to the system. We had the ability to click on the products that took us to an overview of the products where we were then able then to potentially add to the basket. Now, of course, we didn't get that far. That's what we're going to try and achieve in this tutorial. We're going to try and build the basket system so that users can add items to the basket, preparing the items to be paid for. So yeah, we pretty much built a catalog system. So here we had a drop down with all the different um, different categories of books that we had. And of course, you could go ahead and expand that to different categories. So here's a preview of what we're trying to build. This isn't the complete version of what we're trying to build in this tutorial, but you can get the essence of what it is that we're trying to build here. We're building a basket system. So you can see at the top right hand corner here, we have the basket. There is currently four items in our basket. So a visitor, a viewer, a customer would come to our website, select our products, and they can then add items to the basket. So you can see that it works instantly. As soon as I add something to the basket, it then increases the quantity of items in my basket. Now, of course, I can add different types of quantities if I want to into the basket of different items. But when I'm ready, I then want to pay for the items. So I can head over to the basket area, which we're going to build. And then from here, if there were more items, they would appear underneath here. You can see that we've got the subtotal of all the, so we've got six items that we want, six of these items we want to purchase at $15.99. So we've got the subtotal. Now in the next tutorial, after this part three, then we go through the actual payment system. So this tutorial is focused on generating and building this shopping basket and the functionality to update, delete, the items within the basket. So you can see that we're going to be utilizing Ajax to automatically update items on the page so we don't have to refresh the page every time we want to update the information. So that will be included in this tutorial too. So the stages of this tutorial, I'm going to go through first of all refactoring. So I'm going to draw down, download the previous tutorial and just go through around about 15 different stages where I'm just going to refactor and change some of the code just to upgrade uh, and just to delete some items that we don't need, just to tidy up the project a little bit more. So like I said, the refactoring process is an optional stage or step that you can follow. Now you can use the timeline in the YouTube description to skip this section. So you don't have to do that. It is a, an important step. What's going to happen is I'm going to download the previous tutorial and then just go through some stages whereby I'm just going to delete some items, update some file names and so on, just to improve slightly the code readability. This type of step does allow us to reconnect with the project. Maybe you've done part one, and you're now starting part two over a certain amount of time. So it does reconnect us back to the project and remind us of all the files and systems that we have in place that we developed in part one. So once we've gone through the refactoring process, I'll take you through an introduction to sessions or the concept or the idea of a session in a web application. So I've got some visuals uh, for us to go through. We'll have a look at Django and look at some simple commands that we can utilize just to familiarize ourselves with sessions and the general principles of sessions within Django. So I do recommend you read through the Django sessions documentation. It's not too long and it does give you a great overview of using sessions within Django. I'll point you towards that when we get to that section. And then of course we move on to the development. So there's going to be three stages here. Essentially, uh, we're going to go through logically and break this down into small components. So we go through the steps of adding items to the basket. So we go through that code 
and then we'll then extend that into deleting from the basket and then finish off that with updating the basket. So there's three kind of clear activities that we need to perform here. And like I said, essentially, what we're doing here with sessions is we're building a CRUD system for sessions. And that will probably become a little bit clearer once you understand a little bit more about sessions and what sessions are. The fact that we're storing data on the server and we just need to update, delete, um, or add to that session or add new sessions in order to save data that can be utilized by individual users. And then finally, we'll move on to testing. Now, my original plan was to test after each development stage, but I'm gonna try and present the code to you to make it easy to understand as much as possible. And that might mean that I present code in part one and then slightly change it for part two, for example. So testing at each stage didn't quite seem like the, the best thing to do because we'll probably need to change the tests as we go along. So again, testing at the end here is optional. Your code should work without testing. Um, but I just want to take you from through some other uh, techniques with testing because here we're going to test, for example, Ajax. So that's, um, that's a different technique that we're going to use to test Ajax, for example. And then we're just going to make sure all the tests are updated for the whole system, of course. And then we'll be ready to then move on to part three. And that's implementing the payment system. Hello, and welcome to the first stage refactoring. So this stage is optional. You can skip it if you want to. What's going to happen here is I'm going to download the Django code, run the project from the previous code, and then just go through the code, make some small changes. So with the code readability, have a look at some file names and change some file names, remove the redundant code, and then add some features, just some small features, just to improve upon the code slightly and just prepare the code ready for this new step of adding the sessions. So if you haven't already found this, there is a link in the previous tutorial. Uh, alternatively, you can just go to the GitHub website and type in Very Academy or just search using Google Very Academy and search for the project and then just go ahead and download the code. So I've gone ahead and made a new folder on my desktop here and I've extracted the folder inside of this folder. Now, one thing I could do is open up this folder here and then just run the, the project from this file. But what you'll find is that this is quite a long name. And in the command prompt, it just means that the commands are just slightly over to the right too much. And although in the command prompt we can remove these names, uh, it just makes it a lot easier just to rename your projects nice and small to make yourself more room in the command line in Visual Studio Code or just in the command prompt. So once you've changed the folder name, I'm just going to now access this folder via Visual Studio Code. So I'll go ahead and open up a new folder and I'm just going to look for the desktop and then a new folder called new folder P2. And here we go. So this is the project. I select the folder. Now the folder and repository that you download from GitHub won't have the virtual machine. So you will need to go ahead and build your virtual machine for this. So in Windows here, uh, VMV, oh, VMV. So I'm just gonna make a new virtual environment. Now, if you are using Mac, it's gonna be very similar commands. It might be the word Python instead of PY, for example, or Python 3 and then the command. So now we've got that in place, we can obviously access it. Now these type of tasks here for new developers, it doesn't feel very intuitive to begin with, but I promise you, the more you do this, the easier, the easier this will become. Now I remember here, I said about changing the name of the folder. Now, if I didn't change that folder name, the folder name would have been up here, for example. So my codes will be hanging on the right hand side here and coming down. And it just makes it harder just to to read the commands when you type them in. So I start the virtual machine and now I've got my readme text here. You can see everything that needs to be installed to run this project. So let's go ahead and just uh, pip install all of this. So I'm gonna need minus the R flag and then requirement text. So I've gone ahead and just installed all these dependencies that are gonna be needed to run the project. Once you're done, it should work. So py, manage py, run server. So that should start the server and you can see the location of where the server will run. 
So let's go back and run the server. And you can see, there we go, the server is running now. The code that's on the repository, I have included the database. So you can see straight away that you've got items in the database, just one single item. Now, if you want to access and add more, you just need to slash admin. That's going to take you to the admin area where you can type in the username admin and the password admin. And that would take you into the database, into the admin area. And if you want to add more products, you can notice that there are two products. One isn't shown because it's not active. So I can just save that, go back to my home. I can view the site and you can see that the other product is available. There we go. So that starts the project. So let's go ahead and start changing. Right. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go into my my project here and you if you remember from the first project inside of the store we created a context processor that context processor allowed us to run code throughout the whole of the project so that context context processor let's go into the core and settings you can see here we connected the store views category so in the views we have a, a function here called categories and we connected that to the context processor and what that allowed us to do was to make this data available this context the data available in all of our templates within our project so that was a way of making this context this available this data available throughout a whole project now what i wanted to do first was just to change the name of this just to follow this convention slightly so i'm going to make a new file inside of this store folder here store project sorry uh, i'm going to create a new file here called contextprocessors.py there we go so then i'm going to go back to the settings and then instead of store views I'm now going to change that to store.contextprocessor.categories. And you can see that follows a general pattern that has been utilized here by Django. Um, and that just establishes the fact that I am using a context processor within this application here. It just makes it a little bit more uh, obvious that I am doing that. So what I need to do now inside of here is I actually need to kind of make that change. So if I go into views, this was the context processor we were trying to access because remember in the navigation bar, we had a drop down of the categories and we were using this to collect our categories and then listing it out in the header section of our template. So all I need to do here is just remove this and then go back to my context processor and add this in. So of course I am using the categories or the category model. So I'm going to need to bring that model in too. There we go. And that just breaks up that piece of code, makes it obvious the fact that I'm using a context processor. So of course we can test that out by going into our project, hopefully. If I can open this up. So our project is running. So if I refresh this page, you can see that we still have this drop down. Um, we're still accessing all the all the categories. Of course, we can go into the admin area area here and add some more categories if we want to. So let's just do that very quickly to show you that's working. So let's have a category called React, save that, and then go back to my site. You can now see I've got category React. And there we go. So that's all working. Now, while we're here, it's worth noting that I've got some links here which are a little bit redundant, so I don't need to search at the moment. I'm not using that. And I probably don't need home and link and then bookstore because most people are pr probably now know that by type or by um, selecting the the logo of a site that normally takes you to the home page so so i probably don't need a, a link called home and this link doesn't do anything so let's just uh, remove that as a second task in our refactoring here so let's go over to our templates so just remind ourselves that we're in the templates and we had the base now that base remember is the template that we're using um, to then bring in other templates. So inside of this template here, um, let's go down to and find the link. So we've got this link here, so I can move the list item and then the home item here. We don't need that. So let's go to that. And if I move up slightly, you can see that this bookstore, the uh, nav bar brand, the bookstore here, it doesn't link to anywhere. So if I type in slash, that is referring to the root directory of my server. So if I do that and press save, 
now um, when I click on bookstore that takes me to the home page there we go so I can now go back to the home page via the bookstore logo so I wanted also just to remove the search as well so if I go down here we have this form here form starts and ends that's the search bar so I don't need that at the moment that's maybe an optional development we can do later on so let's go ahead and remove that and now we can see that has now been removed now I do also want to just personal taste I want to kind of uh, reduce the size of this box here so I can see a little bit more of the books when I enter the page so let's go back up to the the right page now that's the base so this is the home page now we're working in that's where we saw this section here now to change this you can see here we've got some padding on the y-axis here and at the moment um, it's set to five so if I reduce the padding the y-axis padding here of this block that's going to then reduce the size or the padding top and bottom here so if I refresh now you can see it's smaller so I can just make that a little bit smaller that gives me a little bit quicker access into my products okay next up so in the previous tutorial I set up a let's go back into our into our store and the views so inside of here what we had was we had an object manager here when we selected all products we had objects and all so objects is the default model manager for example um, so what happens is that we select all the products so from product we select all the items and then we output them now the problem with this is that some products we don't want to show because they are unavailable or they we just haven't selected them as active because we don't want to sell them just yet or we want to remove them from sale so what we can do here I think we did this in the previous tutorial we created a filter and then we selected um, to remove uh, is active so we said something like is active equals um, false for example or tr sorry true so is active equals true and that made sure that any product that was selected as as, as sorry any product that was selected as active um, showed or was available on our storefront now what I wanted to do was to create a new model manager here and that allowed us to kind of produce a default outcome for when we select the data so what we're going to do is we're going to make a new model manager and we're going to then create a default output which is going to be all the products minus the products that aren't active for example so here I've changed objects to products so what I need to do now is make my new model manager so if I close this and then go into my models I've already pre-created this and I don't want to go into too much detail but essentially what I've done here I've added the uh, model managers here to my to my model so you can see that the products equals the product manager and the objects equals the model manager the default model manager so what happens is when I use this products instead of objects to select my objects from this model it means that now it's going to perform whatever action this product manager this new model manager has defined so up the top here I've created this new model manager class product manager extending from dot manager models manager and here what we've done is we're returning um, a different query set so we're getting the query set and then we're creating a filter here so we're doing all the back end work so we're doing all the filtering in the model file so our aim is always to try and think about making our views as skinny as possible and our models as fat as possible so we want to try and perform all the actions where possible within the models file make it as fat as possible and then the views nice and thin so here you can see I've created a filter so is active equals true so what essentially this is doing by default is returning the query set now I may run other filters on this so in the views I may run other queries uh, etc utilizing this product manager but it's always going to show me products that are only active so whatever filter I make in the views it's also then going to add any other filters to it and filter out that data and only produce and return data that is active so it's only going to return products that have been set active
Okay, so that is there by default. So now what's going to happen in my views, I'm just going to be returning all the products that are active. So as you saw previously, when I, uh, when I went to the admin and turned on the products, if I go back to products, and if I just select this as not active, that's now false. So therefore it won't get returned on the home page. So if I now go to the site here, it doesn't get returned. So that's just by default now. So any, any queries I now run with that new model manager, it will just filter out anything that's not active. Okay, so the next one, just something that I wanted to do uh, in the core, in the settings, I'd just like to remove any of the comments. So I don't need to have any of these comments and I do want to potentially show you how to tidy this up a little bit more, separate it into production and development settings. So I'd just like to go ahead and just remove these because I don't need these. You might want to keep them, up to you. There we go. Okay, so that's all that in place. Okay, so that's the next task. So the next thing I want to do is just uh, change some of the naming. So I'm just going to go into the store and then go to my views. And I just want to change some of the naming here. So notice that the actual name product category is first and then the action is second. So or um, the the other keyword which describes what it is um, that the view potentially might be performing. So here is what the view is based upon the product or the category. And then here is the action or the word that potentially describes what this um, function is trying to achieve. So here you can see it's the wrong way around. That's what we did uh, previously. So here I'm just going to change this to product. Oh, so that seems like a, a good descriptions there. So all the products, I'm going to return all the products. Uh, so once I've done that, now we need to remember that uh, this is reliant or other files are reliant on this name. So I need to go over to the URLs. Uh, and this just, if you're not familiar with Django, um, helps you identify some of the connectivity here. So what I need to do here is product all, because uh, that's the name, the new name of the view. Just double check product all. Yep. And then obviously the name I can change here too. Okay. So that should be that in place. And you can see that the server is now running. It was causing an error, but um, it looks like it's um it's all good to go now. So I can double check. Nope. So it says a reverse for all products not found because in actual fact, because I've changed the name here, this is being referenced by the templates. So what I need to do now is go into the templates and find out where that is. So let's go back into our templates. Now it's likely it's going to be um, here. So I can just type in product. I think it's products all, wasn't it? Or products. We can have a look here. So it tells me here that um, all products, so it's all products. So I could do a search, of course. Um, I could do a search uh, easily for the whole, for all the files. I'm sure I could. So I'm just doing this manually. So this should be product all. So I'm just going to do a replace. So that should replace that. So let's go back, refresh, and there we go. So that looks like it's a working okay. So I've just simply made a change there to the, the view name and notice I had to change the URL and also the template. So that was in the, the base file. Apologies if that wasn't very clear. Um, that's on line 30 there. Okay, so now I just wanted to just to make sure I'm using the right titles. So my shop doesn't look like it's going to be the right title or the right kind of naming convention here. So I'm thinking a little bit about SEO here. So my shop is called book site or book store. So I'm just going to change the name of that title. And then I'm just going to check to make sure that the home, the home does actually override the title there. That I've just typed in. So I don't want to call it home. Let's call it bookstore. Okay. And 
I think uh, we should go into the products and then have a look at the detail page here. So the title is a product name, that's okay. And then the category title um, is the category name or products. So that looks okay. Um, that takes the category name, that all looks good. So next up, I wanna change the naming here of this template detail, um, because I don't feel as though, for me personally, um, describes what I need. So I'm gonna change this to, to product. So I think that's probably maybe, uh, no, 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 no. Let's change this, sorry, to single. So that's what I was thinking, well, wasn't single. Okay, so here I'm saying the category products, product category or products single. So for me, that's a better description of what is I'm looking at. I'm looking at the single product or I'm looking at the products categories. Uh, so I've changed that to single. Now, because I've changed that to single, of course, this is being referenced within the store views. So I need to go to the views and just make sure um, that it now doesn't say detail here. So this product detail, uh, I'm gonna have single. So it's gonna return a template for the single product. Now, I'm not gonna change the product, um, the function name here, product detail, because that is producing the detail. This function here is producing the detail of the product, the details, the data. Whereas I feel as though the product um, template, this is um, outputting the single product. For me, that makes um, better sense. So I'm gonna go with that. Um, of course, you can rename it however you like. Uh, but that's what I'm going to go for. I think that's the only changes that I need to make for yeah, for that. So let's move on. Okay, next up, I'm not very happy with this structure here I have in the URLs of the store. So it says item and then the actual product item. So item doesn't seem like a very good name for SEO. So what I'm going to do, um, I guess, a similar practice to Amazon again. I'm just going to have the name of the product. So I've got the empty string here for the homepage. And then if there is an item that's been um, entered, then it's gonna be matched here and it's gonna show the product. So I think with that in place, we're probably gonna to need to make some other changes elsewhere, but let's just test this out. Uh, so if I go to my product, you can see now, instead of it saying um, store, or whatever, it just has the name of the product which seems like a, a better way of working. Now I don't want the slash, the trailing slash. So let's get rid of that. Now it might fail at this point, it's not a problem. Um, yeah, so some of these may um, fail. It might be that you just need to recreate them um, to get that working. So let's just go ahead and show you that. Because some of the um, slugs are already made, it might be in the database that they're already being saved in the database as admin slash, for example. Oh, sorry, um, as Django slash. So let's just change that to Django. Ooh, didn't want to do that. Django beginner. I press press save, and I'm just going to activate this again. Okay, so now I go to beginner. There we go. So you can see that it's. The slug is changed now just to the name of the product. Okay, so that's probably better search engine optimization. Now let's move on to the next step. So what you'll probably also find in this file is a GitHub ignore file. Now, obviously, if you're familiar to GitHub, this isn't a problem at all, um, or this isn't really a thing that you need to know. But GitHub ignore files allows you to um, ignore certain files when you're managing your Git repository. So only these files then will get uploaded. Anything in the Git ignore that's uh, registered in Git ignore or defined in the Git ignore file, Git will ignore those files and then not upload those, upload those to the repository. Now there's a number of folders and files here that you don't want to upload. For example, if I go into store here, I've got some cache here um, that doesn't need to be uploaded to the repository. This is just um, is it Python Bitstream. Uh, so this is basically pre-compiled code to make your system or your application a little bit faster, for example, to give you a, a rough idea of what's happening there. So what we can do is we can create a, a GitHub ignore file. 
Oh, sorry. Get ignore file. Sorry. God, I don't know why I was then. Git ignore. Um, and inside of here, we can then add the files and folders that we want to not include in Git. Now, I'm not using Git with this repository, so this is just an example. But what you can do, if you're if you're not too sure what not to include, if you just type in Django git ignore, um, it's going to take you to this um, toptool.com, and someone here has actually created this wonderful file here with all the common type of ignores folders and files that you want to ignore uploading to github and you can just basically copy and paste that in and utilize that so you can see if i move down apologies how quickly this is you can move down here and you can see that the event folder will not be added in the github ignore notice that the color of it at the moment i press save and if i had github or had git activated here um, then these folders would be grayed out so it clearly identifies that they won't be accessible or utilized um, in your Git repository. So that is available and I've added that to the repository just for you to have a look at. Right, so we've got that in place. So let's uh, move on to the next task. So the next task is a simple one, um, but just as important. Now, I just wanted to have a default image. So inside of my store and model, if I go down to the images here, what I've done is I've, I'm uploading any, any images to the image folder, the media image folder. Now what I want to do is add a default. So if someone forgets to add an image or doesn't have one available at the moment, then they can use the default image. Because the problem at the moment is that if we don't add a default image, you force that person to actually upload an image for a product, whoever wants to add products um, to your system. So what I'm just gonna add here is the ability just to utilize a default image if someone forgets or doesn't have an image um, that they want to use for their product. So the default is just going to be the name of the folder, images, and then slash default uh, PNG. And then all I'm going to do there is just uh, open up one of these images in the folder. And I'm just going to create a new image called default.png. So I'm just going to take this image here, copy and paste it. I rename it to default. It's already a PNG. I can, let's use um, edit and paint 3D. Uh, and let's just, uh, let's just change the color of it and just press save. Wonderful. Okay, so now we have a default image. So anytime now we create a new product, Let's go back and create a new product. That should just use the, the default. Uh, I've got a syntax error because I didn't use a comma there. Okay, so back in here, make a new product. Let's just quickly build a product. And see, I'm not gonna choose a file this time. I'll make a price and then press save. And then we go back to now the store you can see it's using that default image. So going back now into the URLs, so let's go back into the store URLs. So I was, I was also not very happy with the search option here. I felt as though we could do a little bit, something a little bit different here. Um, it doesn't really show, or it doesn't really work for me for SEO. So I'm gonna change that to shop. And then the name of the category, I think that, is a better description of what we're looking at or potentially for SEO, a better description of the URL. So I'm just gonna change them search to shop, um, make that small change. So next up, I want to add a new test. Now, if you're familiar with Django, you'll know that when you implement your application or when you deploy your application, you're going to need to change the allowed hosts. So for example, if you were to if you were to deploy your application onto a server um, and then you have a domain name associated to that server, you would need to make sure that in Django in the allowed host that that domain name is in place so that basically that would tell Django that this application of Django is accessible, is usable on that domain name. 
So it's important to make sure potentially that the domain names that are here in the allowed hosts are set properly so that when you do deploy it, you know that it's going to work. So what you can do is test for that, of course. So I've gone ahead and inside of my inside of my store, I have a, a test folder. Inside of here, we have models and views. So let's just make this part of the, the views. Um, so let's go ahead and just quickly build up a test, or unless I put it in models, I may have already made it. Um, I don't think I have. I had a sneaky suspicion I'd, I'd already made it. Oh, I have already made it, it's just it. So in the views, um, you'll see here, I've made a new test. I've called this test URL allowed hosts. Fairly descriptive here. So I'm going to test the allowed hosts that are available here. So you can see here that I've created similar to what we've done previously. We've used the client. So C is referring here to the client. That's the tool that we're using to kind of simulate the browser here in our testing. So you can see here um, that I'm testing just the home page, the slash the home page. And I'm here, I've added this extra parameter called HTTP, HTTP host. So the HTTP host must equal this in order for um, it to work correctly. So you can see here, this is the incorrect um, address. So if I go back to my settings, core settings, you can see here the allowed host, so yourdomain.com and also the local host. So that's what I've set up as the allowed host. So in my testing, you can see here that I've set up a test that I know will fail and we return a 400 not found. And then the status code 200, because I know this domain should work when I try and access the website. So that works and I return an okay status of 200. So this is a simple test using a cert equal. So the response status must equal 200. So what I've done here is I've set up a new variable called resource uh, response, sorry, and I've, I've used the client to send a HTTP get request to this path. Now then I've also sent within that get request this information, the host information. And if the host information, um, if this host information does match the Django settings allowed host, then in the response, I get back from this request, there's going to be the status code of 200. So here I'm just checking using a cert equal, whether the response, the response, the status code within that response from sending off this HTTP get request to the server um, returns 200. And if it does, then it's true. So these tests are just added there just for show, just to show you the fact you can do that. Okay, so that's that simple test done. So now it's probably a good time to think about using um, iSort. So remember, this is going to sort my, it's going to sort all my pages, uh, iSort. So it's going to sort all of my imports into order and then alphabetical order. So three groups. So we've got the core uh, Python libraries, then we have the Django imports, and then we have the actual individual um, software imports, uh, the internal kind of imports here to different uh, views and products, etc. So we've got three different areas. They are separated by a space, of course, and then underneath the parameters here for the kind of Python uh, pep guide, the style guide, we need two spaces, and then that takes me to the skip. Okay, so that's been set up, and you notice by running that command there, I sort space dot, that will show that will go through every file in your project and make changes. And you can see here that potentially um, that's made changes to some of those files. So that's now set up. So now I can run flake eight. So that's going to check all my stylistic conventions here. So you can see here that there's a few issues I've got. Um, so you can see that this isn't being used. So let's go over to that file. So it says here the um, settings file. So that's in my core. So this has just been randomly added in by me just to show you that. So that isn't needed. Okay. So it says here um, in the contact processor. So if I go down to that, I need a space here. Remember that you're going to need a space and also to re remove the white space in order for that to work. So that's that done. A blank line at the end of the test views. 
So I'm going to need a blank line at the end of the line, at the end of the. So here again is the same problem. I need to make sure there isn't any white space. Um, so that sets out those two things there. So I can run flake eight again. So it looks like now my code has been refactored and follows the PEP8 guidelines, or at least tries to adhere to them. So last of all, then, I guess we need to now just um, add some, well, nearly last of all, we need to do some tests. So let's just um, do some test, just type in test. Uh, so you can see that I've got a few um, problems now with my tests. That's because I've changed uh, some of the information and my links, for example, now don't match up. I'm not using item and also yeah, I'm not using item. So that's not going to work properly. So let's go back into my, my tests. This is going to be in my views. So my test view file, you can see here, I'm no longer using item. So that isn't going to work. So slash Django beginners. Now also I've changed the title of my pages. So home no longer says home anymore. It now says store bookstore. So I just need to change that. Okay, so just double check the links. Django beginners. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are in place. So let's just double check this again. So run my tests again, and you can see that still one has failed. Um, so I still have items somewhere, so I just need to kind of search for that. Maybe that's in my, my other tests, my models. Looks like it. Okay, so let's just uh, remove that from there. So in addition to that, we probably also have changed our the name of the reverse here. Um, so we just need to be careful of that. So we're looking for the reverse all products. So that's probably something else that we need to also, also do. So we've got the trailing slash somewhere. So this has taken a while, I do apologize. So let's just remove that trailing slash. So this is all part of the process, of course. So test. So here we got in the views, kind of import name all products from store views. Um, store and views, so all products. So let's go back to our views and all products. So we've got product all. So if you take a look at the, the views, test views here, you can see that we're trying to import all products. Um, so if we go into our view, you can see it's now called product all. So we're just trying to call the wrong view. So let's just go ahead and change these three items here, line 75. So that's changing products all, all products to product all. That's in the test views. Okay, so we got to the end. So now we've changed that. We now have 12 tests. They've all run okay, and we're good to go. So finally, just uh, two new items that we're going to include to start our new product project. I've always said a product already. I've always start, already started it. So the new project. And we're first of all, we're going to add a new file here, a uh, new folder, sorry, called static. So we're going to create some static inside of the static. We'll create a new folder here called CSS. And in addition to that, a new folder called JS. So these are static files and they're going to be served in our project. We're just going to manually add this in for now, our CSS and JavaScript that we might use within our project. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to add some JavaScript here inside of a new JavaScript file inside of our static area. So if we want to access that from our templates, 
if we want to access these static items from the template, what we're going to need to do is two things. So first of all, we're going to need to go to the core settings and set up static. So at the bottom here, I've already done that. So you can see I've set up the static URL and the static files directory. And you can see here I'm using the base directory and then static folder. And that tells Django where the actual static file is placed. So there isn't anything else I need, else I need to do at this point. That's where the static files are. Now, later on, when, once we start playing around and using the templates, I'll show you how to actually connect your static files in your template to this folder. So this is the final one. So another thing, just to remember, we're using Ajax here. Now, in the previous tutorial, in the templates, um, we went ahead and we downloaded and utilized the Bootstrap styling. I think we did that. Now, what we need to be careful of is that we're using the right version um, of, of Bootstrap and also we're using the right version of jQuery because we're going to be using jQuery in this tutorial to actually set up the Ajax. It just makes it a lot easier to type out. So what we need to remember is just make, well, we just need to make sure that we're using the right version of Bootstrap um, so we've got the CSS and we've got the bootstrap um, JS. And we also want to include the jQuery that will work with Ajax. So if you type in jQuery CDN into Google here and just go down and I'm using three, I'm going to use the, I think it's the minified version. I think that should be okay. Uh, so I'm going to copy the minified version, this script here. I'm just going to put that in the top. So this is going to be just before the J, just after the CSS bootstrap, bootstrap CSS and before the JavaScript for bootstrap. So add that in and then we're good to go. Okay. So you might imagine that was quite a long winded process. And if you have managed to follow all of those steps, that's probably an hour of your life. You're not going to get back. And I do apologize for that, but it is a process that I wanted to take you through because there's a number of steps there. If you're not familiar with doing this, it just helps and eases you into the idea of uh, fixing and solving problems. And also to get yourself a little bit more familiar with how items are connected together, how pages and resources are connected together. So you will find in the repository a link to both pre-refactoring and post-refactoring there. So you can start off with the actual code if you if you didn't get past that refactoring stage, or if you're not too confident, you can just start from when the code has been refactored. Okay, so we're going to now start. So let's move across uh, to talk a little bit about sessions. So again, if you're familiar with sessions, you can move ahead to the next section, um, but I'm now just gonna be talking a little bit about sessions. Okay, so you're here because you probably don't know anything about sessions. So let's just uh, make that presumption. So a session then. So this is kind of a old type of, I won't say technology, but it's a, it's a very kind of, I guess I want to use the word monolithic uh, approach to performing some sort of tasks in web. Now I say monolithic as in kind of an old way of doing things, but um, the reality is that sessions can still be ut utilized today in web applications for a number of different reasons. So a session then. So a session, think of a session to begin with as information, as data that we store within, for example, the server side area. So this session isn't stored and the session data isn't stored on a host machine. It's stored somewhere behind the scenes, maybe on a server. And this is kind of temporary interactive information, which we can change and update. And the idea here is that we have a single session stored on the server, say, uh, for every single person that we want a session to be activated for. So the idea here is that we set up a session, could be in a database, for example. So basically we have a table called session and inside of this table, we have two um, rows or two so columns. We have session ID and session data. So a user comes to our website and we make a new session for them. So we go into our database, create a new session ID, which is completely unique. Now we give that session ID to that user who's just connected to our website. 
and then we create some data, whatever data it might be for that user. Now a user might go ahead in our website and maybe add items to their basket. So the idea is that when a user adds those items to the basket, we tell Django that that user wants to add that item to the basket, and then we update their session, their data that we're storing, their session data that we're storing in our database, for example. Now, in order to get to that session, that's particular session for that user, we use the session ID that the user has sent to the server. So that way we can match through the session ID, the user and the data that is stored on our server, on our database about that user. So that way we basically st store in the back end the session ID and the session data, and then we can match that to users requests on the front end. So essentially all we're doing is saving data um, that we want to save about useful things that would be useful to save about the user, about users actions that we can then edit and interact with and then return back to the user. So take for example, the basket situation. A user, like I said, comes to our website, we start a session, we give that user a session ID. Then that user adds items to the basket and then we update the session data in the background using the session ID from the user. And then that's then stored in a session. Now the user can then see all their items that they want to um, buy at any time because they can just access that data via the session ID that the session data stored on the server. And there we go. So we can delete that information, we can retrieve that information and so on. So that's the basics here. Um, now I'll just go through this in a few different ways. Let's just talk about kind of a visual representation of what's going on here. I've kind of already mentioned that. And then we we'll go and have a look at Django and have a look at the table that's already pre-created for us to store session data. And then we we'll have a look at some session data and I'll just show you um, how to view the session data and maybe kind of translate that session data into the kind of encoded format that it's stored in into the decoded format that we can actually see and use. So what we're trying to do here is like I've probably already said twice, but we start with a browser. We request a page from Django. Django creates a new session. That session data is stored then in a new entry into the database. We store two things, session ID and session data. Okay, so when we're done, when we're done with that, Django will send back a new page or whatever page that's been requested or resource that's been requested. And it will also send back to the browser a session ID. And that's a unique identification or unique identifier that's been created here in the session database for that particular user. Now in the front end here, what we do is we store that session ID in the cookie, for example. So we store that in a cookie and I'll show you that in a minute in our browser and that data is there. So what we can now do is we can now request or we can um, add items to our database. So anytime we send any data now to the database, we can also send our session ID. So Django can match that session ID that we send from the user to session data in the database, for example retrieve that information from the database, and then refreshing the page again, send it back to the browser. Now this only works to begin with if we actually um, refresh the page every time we want to do something because session data is only stored in the back end by default here. So we don't store any session data in the actual browser. So if you remember what happens, for example, the we request, request a page from Django, Django will recreate or Django will build that page at the back end with the data and the template and process it and then send it back and include the session data on that template and then send it to the browser. So we need to just remember the fact that we can't get session data or updated session data until we refresh the page or we go to a redirected page because Django needs to send that data back or needs to recreate that data, sorry, on the template and then send the template back with the new data. So what we're gonna do here in this system is we're gonna use Ajax, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And what that is gonna allow us to do is without refreshing the page, we can send a message to the server with Ajax, get it to update the session data we can grab that new data that we've updated in the session, and then we can send it back to a browser and we can inject 
that new information onto the page. Now that's only going to be a temporary thing because as soon as we refresh the page, Django is going to overwrite that anyway with the session data on that template. But temporarily, while we want the user to update um, and delete items, we can use JavaScript and Ajax to actually send requests, delete items, add items, change items in the session data. And then we can use um, initially JavaScript to make those changes on the page while the user is on the page. And of course, when they refresh the page, the page just reverts to um, that anyway that we've changed. So the idea here with the Ajax is we want to kind of replicate what that page will look like when the user refreshes the page. But we want to make the information and we also want to make that page um, automatically um, update when the user does a update something. Because if we don't use Ajax, what happens is that we need to, for example, add an item to the um, basket and then we need to refresh the page. Then we need to delete an item, then we need to refresh the page. So every time we do something, we need to refresh the page. And that's not necessarily the best way or, yeah, it's not, I'm going to say not necessarily the best way of working. So Ajax is going to help us um, make immediate changes to the page without having to worry about refreshing the page. So that's going to become a little bit more obvious as we go through this tutorial and we actually apply it to our application. Now, I just want to go through this. Well, let's have a look at the Django database and the session table. Let's, uh, let's do that first. So this is going to give us a really a visual representation of what the what items are in the database here. So if I go over, just make sure that if you are set up like this, I've got SQLite um, extension installed. So just type it here in the extensions and install it. That allows you to access the database. So if I then go over to the database and open the database, it appears right here. And I can then go ahead and access this. And you'll see here by default, Django has a session database. Now we don't need to store data in a database. Now, if you read the Django documentation and sessions in general, we can store session data. We can cache it anywhere we want, really, where you would normally store cache or cached um, data. This is just the default setup that we're going to run with for this project, which is going to be saving the session data within a, a database. So you can see here, there's two fields, session data, expiry date and session key. So it's three fields. Uh, so we've got the session key, which is a primary key. This is going to be an automated session key, auto generated session key. We've got the session data. And like I said, that's going to be um, encoded. The session data isn't going to be in clear text. It's going to be encoded. And then we've just got the date time. OK, but those are the two key fields that we're going to be working with and manipulating and changing and adding to. OK, so you can see that now. There's, so you can see the format here of the session key. And then you can see further along here, we've got the data. So this session data here, you like to see it's been encoded. Um, but what we can do is uh, unencode, deencode, sorry, this information and see what this information says. So that's something that we can do. So let's go ahead and try that. OK, so to access this data and deencode one of these um, session data strings here, uh, let's go ahead and access the shell. So manage pi and then access the shell here. So now what we can do is just go ahead and access the database. So from Django Contrib sessions models, we need to import the session. So I'm just going to paste that in. So you can see that's what you need to type in to then import the session model. And now we can actually work with this model. Um, so that's now imported uh, that model in here. So what we can now do is we can get some data via the session key. So let's just take this session key here. And what we're going to do is we're going to run a get object. Uh, so we're going to create this variable called s. And then what we're going to do is and go into the session. We've imported session, remember. So session objects dot get. So get a single item from a database where primary key equals this, which is this key here. So this is the data here. Um, of course, you might not be able to do this right now, but you can do this later. Uh, so go ahead and do that. So now we've got that data stored in this S variable. We can now use get D encode to decode it and have a look to see what we got. So there we go. So you can now see uh, we've got a session data here. Um, this is the data that's actually inside 
of this session information. So we've got the user ID, uh, user backend, um, user auth user hash. So we've just got some data here, but you can clearly see this is data. Um, so this is data being stored in this session. Move it across. If I can just move this across. It's being stored here in the session data. And there we go. So the last thing here, we have this expiry date. So this isn't something I've spoken about just yet. So uh, let's remember, or if you don't know, <laughs> so let's remember. Uh, so what happens is we give a user, this is a random user we don't know, we give them or we set up a session ID for them. Now what we can do is we can manage that session in many ways. So for example, we can make a new session for that user and have it expire at a certain time. Maybe we only want a session to last a week or a day or an hour. And we can also set up a session so that only a session is persistent or only a, a session is only available when the user is actually gone to our website or when the browser is open, when that tab is open. So we can set up a, uh, the expiry date to occur at any time we want essentially or any date or any certain time. So that's a fairly important type of principle when we're setting up cookies to kind of work out um, when that cookie on that user, when that ID will actually expire. Because we, we don't want IDs, session IDs to be available forever because people potentially could infiltrate, they could um, access session data via the session key by guessing the session key. So we want something that's um, a little bit more secure. Uh, of course, this session data isn't very secure because once we work out where the key is, potentially we can access the information. So again, the session data here probably isn't something, we don't want to put something um, in this session data that we don't want anyone to be able to see easily. So best not to put passwords in there, for example, or any other sensitive data. So that's uh, a little bit about that and how to access the session data and de-encode the session uh, data. Okay, so we've de-encoded the session data. So let's have a look at the browser end now and see where this data is being stored. So uh, let's go into our into our console. So I press F12. I am in here. I'm using Chrome here, so it might be similar to your browser if you're using Firefox, etc. F12. So you can see if I go to application in the tabs here and I go to cookies you can see that I'm storing a cookie here um, for this website. You can see there's nothing there. So let's go over to the bookstore, press F12. Uh, let's have a look, see what it's doing here. And you can see here in my bookstore, I now have session ID. So there is something here that I'm actually storing, uh, which is very interesting. And you can see that um, I have a, a value here, and this is my session ID. So let's have a look at this 4R at the end here. So see if we can match that with our session data here in the database, and we can. So we can see that that session data here represents this session ID, which is then also on our actual browser, stored in our browser. So this is representing the fact that I'm actually logged in as admin. So when I go to admin here, it just takes me to the admin page without asking me to log in. I believe that's why I've generated a session or have session data at the moment. Anyway, so you can see that happen you can see that happening. You now know where the, the cookie or sorry, you know where the session ID is being stored in the cookies. And you can also see that there's a corresponding CSRF token uh, which we ought to use potentially to actually send data alongside our session data. But that's a little bit out of the scope here. So let's just focus on session ID. Okay, so hopefully that was useful. Hopefully that gives you a little picture now of what sessions are and how they're kind of integrated and um, utilized within Django by default. Remember, there's lots of different settings here that you can change. We're just gonna be utilizing the default settings. Okay, so finally, before we start developing, um, let's just make sure that sessions are enabled. Now, this is one of those things where if you're just starting a new application, by default, utilizing uh, the Django admin, um, this is going to be available, but there's two items here that need to be um, applied in your application to start sessions by default in Django. So you need to have installed app the Contrib sessions. 
So this is the reason why you have a Django session database, because in your installed apps, you have this, which is connected to the need for installing a session database. Um, and that is a reason why you have a session database when you initially migrate your Django project, because we've got installed by default the sessions module. And we also need the, in the middleware, um, this, the middleware, the session middleware, that also needs to be available for sessions to work. So those two things are kind of mandatory. So just double check if you haven't started utilizing Django from the default kind of setup, that that is available before you start. So if you've got to this part, well done. If you've followed up until this point, thank you very much. If you have just got to part one or just moved to part one, then welcome to part one. This is the first stage of the development. So in this stage, we're going to go through a little bit of setup, some templates that need building, and then go through creating sessions, how to create sessions, and then kind of just span out the files that we're gonna need for that and the uh, functions and classes that we're gonna utilize, the structure that we're going to follow. And then once we've done that, we'll then go ahead and start to add the facility to add sessions and then think about using a context processor so that we have site-wide access to the sessions on our website. So in fact, by the end of this part, we have most of the work done in terms of the templates. We just need to then add the extra facilities of deleting and manipulating the data in the session. That's pretty much all we need to do after this point. So let's stop talking and start building. So let's go ahead now and build a new application. So what's happening here is this is a new piece of functionality we want to add into our project. So best practices kind of tell us that um, we want to try and break up our features, our functions um, of our project as best as possible. So by creating a new project here, sorry, not a new project, a new application, we're just decompartmentalizing the basket component that allows us to kind of logically separate the component from the other components in this project. Now we're going to need to think of a naming convention for this. Now this is one of these tricky bits where we have to name this. Um, so typically we want to try and keep to a single name. We can use an underscore for a project for an application name. Now my preference, because it's then nicely ordered in this list, I'm working on the store here, and this is kind of part of the store. However, the whole thing is the store, and we start off with like the core application. But I kind of, I would prefer to name this component that we're going to build, this um, basket, um, store underscore basket. It would then appear nicely in my list here, store underscore basket, and it's just close together to the store. And if I were to build um, maybe a recommendation system for this. So I might have this store recommendation. Kind of makes sense to me to have that in place using the store first and the underscore because then those applications will be listed nicely. But that isn't necessarily everyone's opinion or recommendation, or, although it's up to the person designing and developing obviously what they want to name things. I think we're just going to keep this simple and go for the word basket. Now that was again a couple minutes chatting about just naming. Um, so Let's go ahead now and create a new app. So start app, we're just gonna call this um, basket. Now, the reason why I don't really like to call this basket is because we're gonna call this basket, we're probably gonna have a new class called basket. Everything's gonna be called basket. Um, so just by naming this something different than basket, it just allows me to identify kind of an entry point and then try and use other names within the application other than basket. But we're gonna go ahead and call this um, basket. So let's go into the basket. So we're not going to need um, at this point the, the testing. So let's just prune what we don't need at this point. We're not going to need an admin. So let's get rid of the admin. Um, so apps, models, and views. Okay, so we're going to model this basket in a new class and add all the methods to that class, um, all that functionality to that basket as such. So we are now going to make a new file here and I'm going to call this basket.py. There we go. Okay, so that's going to be a new class where I'm going to model the basket and add the main kind of functionality into this basket and call uh, and then call to it 
from the views when I need some sort of functionality. So that's how we're going to work here. This is how we're going to model this basket. So while we're here, we might as well add the, the URLs. So we're going to need some URLs for this to direct Django to the main basket that we're going to build. So let's put that in. And then of course, what we're going to need to do at this point then is go into the core settings. We're going to need to add this project to the installed apps. And then in addition to that, save that, we need to go into the, the core URLs because now we want to kind of direct the project and extend the paths that are available, the URL patterns. We want to include the basket now. Um, so we're going to give that a namespace of basket. So there's a lot of baskets. Um, there we go. So that's the uh, URLs directing to the URLs. So we're just extending the URL list here and then also basket. Now, of course, we're going to need to change this potentially because we can't have two um, starting from the root. So that's not really a problem here because really we're just going to need one URL or one essentially one URL that we're going to use for the project, which is just going to be the actual basket. So again, um, let's call that basket. That's going to be the entry point to the basket. And then we can then go over to the basket um, and then actually make the basket page. So the idea here is that the user can go to the existing, the, the existing um, home and then the base of the product, the single product, and then they click on the items in that single product and add them to the basket. And then the user will click on the basket and take you to the basket um, summary page. So this is the, gonna be the link to that um, page. So that we start off with the URL. Now this is the URLs in the core, remember. Uh, sorry if this is hard to follow. I'm not really doing this in, in many, many any real order at the moment. So that's the cores and the URLs set up to include the basket URLs. So now we can go into the basket URLs and set up a the new URLs for this. So we're going to um, we're going to need to bring in um, path and then the views. So we'll just import the views or make the view available views available so we can import them in. And then we go ahead and just uh, make our URL patterns. So I have all this pre-coded. I know that some people like to see code being written, but I prefer just to explain it to you. Then you can pause and add the code to your program rather than listen to me type out code. And there's just too many kind of blank spaces. And there's so much to talk about. So um, now we've got that in place. Now, of course, we're going to need a path here for the, the, first, uh, for the first URL. Um, so let's just add that in. So we'll just do that manually. So we've got the path here. Now we're going to use the root because you remember this is being, this is the, the pathway, um, to these URLs. So this is kind of the prefix for the rest of these URLs here. So I just want to go to the basket and then enter or access the basket. So the path can be the root. And then I want to connect this to a view view uh, views dot and then we need a name for this so this is going to be the basket uh, summary page this is where we're going to show all the items in the basket so we're going to call this basket summary and then we'll, let's just name that so we can easily access it if we need to through the name so this is going to be basket summary and there we go i think that's all we're going to need at the moment so let's now just go ahead and access the views. So of course, now we've made the URL pathway into the basket. We're now just going to actually then, well, we might as well make a, a view for this basket. So now this basket, all we're gonna need here is a, a new function. So I am using functions. I prefer to use classes uh, to be honest with you. And no doubt at some point I'll have a single tutorial where I'll just go through and I might call it uh, changing functions into classes in Django, for example. And I can show anyone who wants to just learn about um, translating functions into classes, as well as we'll use this 
uh, project here to kind of translate this into classes rather than functions. Um, so uh, we're going to call this bas basket summary. There we go. Um, and we're going to take in the request, of course. So that's the HTTP request, the user request details. And now we can go off and uh, return. So for now, let's just return a, the render. Uh, so we can take in the request. Um, and now we just need to define. So we're going to create a new uh, folder in our templates for this these templates. So we go into the template, and then this is part of the store. So we go into the store, and then we're going to need to obviously make a new folder called basket. And then this is going to be the summary page, the basket summary page, so summary.html. I suppose I could just call this index, or I could just call it basket, couldn't I? Dot HTML. That's probably a better name. So now we've got that in place. That's pretty much all we're going to need at this point, just to build up the basket. And then, of course, go into the store and then let's make a new folder. Let's call this basket. And then inside of here, a new file. It's going to be called summary. And it kind of makes sense here. Uh, it reads nicely. This is going to be the basket summary. The products category, the products or single products kind of works that way or both ways. So um, the summary of the basket. OK, so on this HTML page here, uh, we're going to should we quickly do this now. We might as well add some items to this because there's some known items that we're going to include. Now, remember the base. That's the base file that we're using at the moment. That includes all the code in the header, for example, for now. And then, of course, we're going to import this in um, into our summary HTML page. And then we're going to put the content and replace this, the content right here. So we're just going to inject whatever content we got in this summary HTML. We're going to kind of inject it into this space here. Now, also remember that we're going to overwrite the title here to, for example, the word basket. Um, so we need to make two overrides here. So let's go into the summary. Um, our, we can probably just go ahead and steal some of this information here. So let's go ahead and do this. So in the summary, we're going to need, um, we're going to extend from, and then this time we're in the, we are in the new folder here called basket. And that is one kind of, uh, of course, this is not in the same folder directory as base. We need to go back one. So here in Windows, dot, dot, dash. That's going to take me back a directory so I can access then the base file. So dot, dot, dash. Let me just check on this. So we're not going to need store. So it's just going to be dot, dot, dash. So go back one from the basket folder and then access the base file. So I don't have any static yet, but I will have. So I'm just going to leave that there. And then we've got the, the title. So the title of this page is going to be basket um, summary. There we go. And then we'll just put the word, oh, we'll just extend and include something in the content, right? So let's go um, the content. So we need to open and close. So we can just kind of end the block. There we go. Uh, and then we're just putting here basket page for now. So we can just see this. And hopefully that's kind of tied up now, all the basket stuff. So we've got the URLs set up. Um, this is going to be the path of the default page from the basket. Remember, we're extending from the basket. And this is going to be the home page or the root directory. And then we're connecting to the view basket summary. Free views here. Um, and I'm giving it a name, get rid of that. And that's then connected to the basket here, this view at the moment. And we're just rendering out the, the template that we've built. So that should now display nicely. So let's close all this up. Let's just run this. And I seem to have a problem. Improperly configured, apparently. Um, just closes up. 
so, oh, okay, okay. Uh, so what we've done is I've, uh, in the URLs here, because I've copied them across, let's go over to the um, the core URL. You notice that what I've done is the namespace. I've included the namespace here, which is kind of a a way for me to, it, within the program, for us to um, identify and utilize URLs in these particular kind of namespaces, in these um, different URL spaces. So what we need to do, if we go into, if we go into the store, you'll see, for example, in the URLs here, we have app name equals store. So that just ties up the URLs to the, the new URL list we've joined here. So we can do the same again with the basket. So we're going to need an, the app name, same as the namespace. Uh, so this is going to be called basket. So that just matches here in the basket URLs, the same as the core URL namespace here. So that's what we're matching up. And like I said, it just makes it easier later on in a program to kind of name the URLs and access the URLs through this naming scheme, this app name scheme. Okay, so now we've done that. Hopefully the server will run. There we go. And let's go and have a look now. So we should have a new um, area. We just have to do this manually for now. Called basket. And there we go. So we've got our basket. So I guess at this point, um, while we're doing kind of the setup here, we can add a new icon here or a new button. We're going to make a, a button to the basket page. So similar to what you might experience in Amazon, you can go to any product page and add it to the basket. The basket will update and then we can click on the basket icon that takes us to the basket and shows us the summary of the basket. basket. And then from there we can pay for the items, of course. So let's go back into our code and just add that in. So this type of project, I know that it helps understanding a little bit more about HTML, of course. And I do kind of skim through some of this HTML and this is where things could untie really quickly if you're not too familiar with utilizing HTML and CSS and so on, um, particularly because we're using Bootstrap. So let's go ahead now and just add this new button. So just head over to Bootstrap if you're not too sure about anything that we're using and go to the documentation and then just type in button, for example. And it's going to give you an overview of the different types of buttons and what maybe some of the classes mean. So you can see here, this the classes here are designed for a button. So the class button will shape the button in a certain way behind the scenes. Button primary is going to give you this blue look. So all these classes represent a style in the background that's pre-created by Bootstrap. So we're going to utilize this, this system to build this button. Um, so we're going to do that, obviously, in our template and then in our products sorry in the in the base sorry because the base has at the moment the base has the the top section the header section um so we need to find where we need to put that so if you're not too sure uh previously what i did was i deleted the uh search uh so let's just let's just type it here for example go back into our basket and you can see that's where we're going to need to put our button so this is the code. Well, this isn't the code. This is where we need to put our code for the button on the right hand side. Now mine's already kind of pre-formatted, so I know that putting anything here it will appear on the right hand side. You may have to put some more additional CSS for your implementation. So what we're going to need to do here, like I said, we're going to build a button. So I'm going to need some sort of icon. Um, so you can go ahead into Bootstrap now, and they do have icons available. So um, if you go over to the icon and then head across to somewhere here oh the icon's down here sorry um it's because such small i'm not familiar uh, so here i'm just going to type in for example basket and there we go so there's a range of different baskets you can use all you need to do is select your basket and then i'm going to be utilizing the svg for no particular reason you can use the icon font of course go ahead and do that but i'm just going to use the, the svg um, so copy and paste that into your project and you can see that I've already done that down here. So I'm using this basket right here icon. So that's the icon. Um, and you can see I've created an A link. So I'm, I want the whole button as a link. So I've created an A tag here. And then what I've done is I've used the roll button to turn it into an actual button rather than just a link. 
So that's a little bit of kind of bootstrap again to kind of change the row and the type button. And you can see here what I've done is I've gone ahead and created a new link to it. Um, so that's going to be the basket summary, actually. Um, so here you can see I've used the word basket and then colon basket summary. So if I go back into um, what's going on here, I'm asking Django to look for the namespace basket. Um, so if we go into the basket and URLs, I'm asking it to look for the namespace basket. And then I'm asking it to look for then the the link that's named basket summary which is this here so then it's basically just going to use and generate this url for me based upon this path so that's how i'm kind of dynamically creating this path here sorry this uh, link here in this space um so that's that generated then i'm obviously I've got a nice little icon and then the word basket afterwards now obviously just before there I'm going to want to in a minute programmatically type in or generate a number for the items that are in the basket. So I'll just put one for now so you can see what's going on. And we'll go back and refresh. You can see I've got a nice basket. Now the problem is here, looks like, um, is that this number one, um, you can see it kind of, it doesn't stretch at all. It looks like it's, uh, it's on separate lines, uh, which is pretty strange. So, um, I'm not entirely sure why it's doing that. So let's just go ahead and create a, a set of divs here because I'm suspecting it's because of this number. And then let's put this number inside of there. So it definitely won't line properly now because there it goes. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, so with that in, in place, I'm now going to try and align things up. So I'm going to create a class. Um, just, uh, I just want to put this kind of in line. So I want to use a flex in line. Yeah. In line, um, flex. That'd be right. So I'm just basically saying that I'm using flex. Basically that's going to put all the kind of divs subsequent uh, elements in the row and I want it in line. So this is going to be a flex in line refresh. And it doesn't quite work. That's a bit strange. So sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, so let's just get rid of this. And I think I'm in the wrong space. I'm going to need to put it here underneath this unordered list. So let's just give this a go. There we go. Okay. So I was just using the wrong space there. Um, so there we go. See, now you can see what it looks like. I'm going to be able to click on this and that's going to take me to the basket. So let's just try this out. Basket, we're at the basket. We're at the home, we're in the basket. So you can see what's going to happen, how we're going to access the basket in this store. So very briefly, I just wanted to tell you about um, how the problem we've got here in Django is it's not quite HTML. Um, it is HTML, of course, in CSS, but we're also utilizing um, Python and Django templating tools. And so when we go to um, try and, for example, use our tools to format the document, um, you'll notice that it doesn't work. So um, some of these extensions that are designed to uh, create nice indentation in your code, it's not going to work for this type of file because it's detecting all sorts of kind of languages here. Um, and so I found that not that I spent too much time on this. Um, I found that I think it's uh, prettier. The I think prettier um, is the one that I've got working with this. No, sorry about that. It's not. It's a uh, beautify. So the beautify is the um, tool that I'm using. Um, this is just by default. You probably can set up these other tools to do this. Um, but beautiful, I think out of the box, um, I've enabled that. And what I can now do um, is go ahead and, or you can already see that I think I've already done it. Um, so let's just kind of beautify this. So control shift and P and then beautify file and then select HTML. And you can see that then that does a good job then 
of just tidying up this code, indentation, indenting it nicely. Um, there we go. So that's the button done. Okay, so I think we've uh, now finished the setup. Um, so now we can go ahead and start actually thinking about creating sessions. So two hours into this to the tutorial, we'll start talking about creating sessions. So let's now go ahead and model our basket. So we've created this new file previously called basket.py. And we're now going to create a new basket class and add some kind of methods in here uh, to perform some actions like add um, add to session, delete session, update session, and so on. And that's going to kind of manage the basket. And we're going to call that into the views and utilize those tools as and when we kind of need them. So to do this, uh, we're just going to need to uh, create a new class. Let's do it. Um, and we're going to call this class basket. There we go. Um, so add some kind of a little bit of kind of documentation. Um, I've pre created this. Just out of the way. Okay, so this is our basket class, providing some default behaviors that can be inherited or overrided um, as necessary. Right, so now what's going to happen here with this class? And there's many ways of doing this. Um, I think I've got this technique from somewhere. I saw this from somewhere and thought that's a good way of doing it. So what we can do here is we can create a, a new function. And this is going to be a um, a dunder in it. Excuse me. So what's happening here is that this is, if you're not familiar with Python, this is basically a reserved kind of method in Python classes. Um, this in it or initialize method. Um, so in kind of object oriented terminology, uh, when we create a new copy um, of the object, this is the object here, the basket, um, this function is going to be run straight away. So as soon as we create um, a new object, um, this is gonna be initialized. This function is going to be initialized and run. So what I want to do here is that thinking about my session, I want to have it so that when this gets initialized, the kind of session is checked to make sure there is a session. And then if a session doesn't exist, this session will be created. And what I then want to do is kind of call this um, potentially on every page the user goes to. So it doesn't matter what page the user goes to, the session will be created and prepared so that they can then put any item they want inside of the basket. So that's the approach here. Hopefully that um, makes sense. Um, so let's go ahead and finish this off. So again, we're going to be using self in all of these functions. And if you're not, again, familiar with that, that's basically what we're doing here is we're kind of setting up these functions so that within this class, other functions can access any of the other attributes uh, with, within these functions. Um, so um, let's go for self and then we're going to take in the request. So again, thinking about this in a more kind of abstract generalized way, what's happening here, this request. So the user sends a HTTP, HTTP request to the server and inside of that request, there's lots of different types of data. And generally speaking, uh, we want we want to kind of access that data um, so we can check the request and we can access information within that request to make uh, different um, decisions and to perform different actions. So we're kind of bringing that into um, this function here. And then what we're going to do, because this is the initialization kind of function, we can then um, make that available with with an all functions potentially. So we only need to bring this once into the the class here. So let's go ahead and now um, start to build a session. So generally, if we want to build a new session, we run request session. And then what you'll find is that there are other kind of uh, components at the end of this that then perform the actions. But generally, when we're working with sessions in Django, request.session, um, uh, that is like the, the key um, command, if you like, to then utilize all the base component to then 
create some different actions with a session. Like I mentioned previously, uh, definitely have a read through here, the how to use sessions here in Django. Um, it's well worth a read. It's, um, I guess it's fairly long, but just read through the main components. You don't need to kind of uh, look through the individuals about what individual things do, but it will um, go through how to save sessions, how to generate sessions. Um, much of the information that we're using here in this tutorial is there. And then you can start thinking about extending what it is that we're building here in this project. So because this is a fundamental for many of the commands that we want to run, um, we can then make it available. Um, so let's do self.session and that equals request session. So we can then call this whenever we need request session. And you'll see shortly um, why that potentially makes sense because everything we do, we're going to need request session. So it just saves us typing request session everywhere. Um, right, so basket um, equals. So now we're going to actually uh, build um, a session. Um, but think about the process. So we need to think about the process again here. So the user comes to our website. Now, if the user is new, if the user has never been to our website before, then obviously they won't have a session available. So we need to build a session. So we need to first of all check to see if um, the user has a session. So if the user has a session, it means that in their browser, they will have a cookie with an ID in that cookie. And that will be referenced by a session name. And that session name is what we're going to make up. So for example, self.session.get. And then we want to get a session with a session kind of key that we're going to build. So here we can just build a session key. So I'm just going to call this session. All right, let's just call it S key. So apologies for the name of that. So session key. So you can call it whatever you like. I was going to call it basket, um, but we didn't want to use another basket again. So uh, that's the session key. So um, that's kind of the reference point um, potentially to utilize to kind of name this cookie because we might make many uh, different um, cookies, for example, or sessions. So we can name it S key. So the first thing we're going to do then is just basically try and get um, and check the user may, if the user does have a, a session already active. So we're going to um, check for that. So if, for example, if, for example, the uh, S key, this, um, this session key does not exist, then, well, we then need to um, set up a new session, right? So basket itself, basket equals uh, self dot uh, session. So here we're using a request session again. And then this time we are then going to set this up. So S key, um, so that's kind of the name of the session and then we need to define what it equals so we need to define the data within it so here we're going to use or should i say we're going to set up this dictionary where we're going to enter some data so remember curlies we're looking at dictionaries and then the box brackets are a list object Okay, so that's the curlies in place. So we're going to set up our session with no data in it to begin with, of course, because the user doesn't have anything saved in their basket. So um, that makes sense that their basket starts off with nothing within it. So we then finish off um, self dot uh, basket uh, equals a basket. So basically, this is going to um, the basket variable here. Um, that we've kind of generated, that's going to equal whatever's inside someone's basket to begin with, um, if there is already in a session that exists, or it's going to equal the new um, session that we've created with nothing inside of it. So we're going to reference that um, as basket, this um, variable called basket, and we're going to be able to access that um, from anywhere within our templates. So the idea is that we can then call this class um, again, and have a look to see what's inside the basket. So that's what we're doing here. So 
Um, the user's going to come to the site. Um, let's just confirm if they've got a, a session that exists. Remember, sessions normally last a certain amount of time. We can control how long a session lasts. So how long that cookie that someone has on their browser, in their browser, how long that lasts or is active or is available to access the data. So if they do have that cookie, that session data, um, that ID, and it matches um, the data that we have in our session table, then we're going to get that data and then we're going to store it within basket. And therefore that's what we, we return and we can then access the data. Now, if they don't have a key, if they don't have any a session available or active, then obviously we're going to build a session, we're going to put that in the variable basket and obviously bring it down here. And now we can store that in basket. And now we know what's inside their basket. So of course, when I run this class, remember this is like an initial initialization um, function. So this will run once we instantiate this class and then we can access that basket data. So what we're going to do now is we want our basket to be available um, throughout our project. So let's go ahead now and make a context processor. Um, so we're going to make a new file here. We're going to call this context processor dot py. There's only one, but we'll call it with a plural. Um, so inside of here, what we're going to do is, well, we need to bring in basket and import the class basket. So from, in this case, dot basket, import basket. So we're importing the class basket. So now we can access basket. And now with inside of that, let's make a new function. I'm just going to call this basket, of course. Uh, let's just take in the request. And remember what's happening here is that we're going to pass this request data into the the class here so that we can utilize it because uh, we need that information so why that is let's just generate generalize and say when the user sends data from the browser they type in whatever domain or so whatever page they're looking for they send that http request over to django now that's all in the request now that data is in the request the session information is inside of that request this is why we're using request here and because we're going inside of this data that the user has sent us um, and we're then kind of grabbing information in it. So that's why we're using the request, why we're passing request into here so we can grab that information, check the session if it exists and then return some data. So that's all part of this kind of request from the user, that kind of data that's been sent across from their browser. Uh, let's think of it that way. So what we're going to do here then in this processor um, is we're going to create a new function, bring in request, and then all we need to do is return and think about the data we want to return. Uh, so basket. So the data that's going to be in this basket, remember this is a dictionary we're creating here, so um, kind of key values here. So basket and then the actual class basket. And then just let's just um, put inside of here the request, send that in, and then we can grab the data out. So what's gonna happen here, what's returning the data in this, uh, data that we're returning here um, is obviously the default data that gets initialized, which is the basket data. Okay, so that's setting up the data. This is kind of the reference point, key value. Um, the value is the, whatever's in the basket. And then this is how to access the data through the keyword basket, for example. Right, so now we've done that. Uh, let's just go over now to, let's just close this up. Uh, so let's go over now to our, oh, our core and settings. And we can now create a new context processor. So this time we want to link to our new processor. So this is going to be called basket dot and then context processor is the name of the file that we made. And inside of there, we have the basket. Just double check that. So basket context processor function basket, lowercase of course. Uh, so there we go. So that links to it. So now we have that available. 
within each template. So that we have something to look at, let's just go back into basket now and uh, let's just go ahead and just add a little bit here. So let's just call this, um, let's just add some data here. So name or let's just call this, for example, let's make it easier. So number and let's just type in this random number here. So we've just added some data. So when we create a new session, it's just going to add some data here. Um, you, this key value here is a number and this random number. So that's what's going to appear by default data wise in someone's uh, session or everyone's session. So let's just test this out now. Now this what's happening obviously is that because it's in the context processor, uh, you can see it's running every time. Um, it's because we've placed it in here, this is going to be run every time we open up a a template say for example so that's going to run this command here you notice that we're kind of creating the class and because we are establishing this class or calling this class we're obviously going to run this uh, function here this runs by default uh, so when we call this class um, so what's going to happen here is going to check to see if the basket exists if it doesn't exist it's going to build a basket um, session and then it's going to automatically just add this into the session data number and this random number. So let's go to the page, refresh. You can now see I'm in the application. So I press F12, I've gone over to application cookies. Now you can just clear that and refresh it again. So I've gone to the home page, refreshed, and you can now see we've got this session ID. So what I want to do is just double check and just show you this is the case. So this is the session ID. Now, if I go over to my console here, I can go into the shell. So you might have saw me, see me do this earlier. Um, if you were looking at the kind of preliminary um, videos that, or parts of this tutorial. Uh, so what we can do here is we can access, if you remember, the uh, session information within the database. So if you've got SQLite Explorer, we can just do it this way in actual fact. Um, so in session, show table. Um, let's bring this across so we can actually see it. So you can see we've got a few sessions here. Now let's just double check again our browser. So it ends 3.8. So you can see here we've got this session here 3.8. Now this is the session data in the middle here. So this session data here somewhere in here it should say um, this random number. So let's now just take this here. Um, so what we're going to do in the shell is we're going to just access that session table from the shell. So sessions.model import session. So we're going to import the, the table there. And then we're going to go ahead and just get this object. So I've kind of pre-prepared this code. I just need this here. So now we can go ahead and create a session or sorry, get the session object. So we're going to get this object here, put it into this variable called S. And then we're going to decode. So we've got the um, the data now. So now we're just going to decode this. And you can see what's inside of the session data. It's just the number one, two, three, four, five. So that just confirms that our code is working at this point. Our basket is working. The data is being inserted when we add a new session. OK, so there we go. Hopefully that was fairly straightforward. Um, I'll be interested to get your feedback, whether I'm giving too much information, not enough information, too fast or too slow. I sometimes get a little bit excited and get a little bit faster. Um, so I do apologize about that. So now we've set up the session, we've gone through those stages and now we've set up the context processor. So we now have this, um, we now have this session available throughout the whole website on every single page, and it doesn't matter what page the user enters the website, a session will be created for them. So it's site-wide access. Now what we need to do is create this, um, we need to be able to add data to the session when the user clicks on a product. Because obviously what we want to do is save the fact that the user selected that product so then we can show that to them in the basket summary page. So let's go ahead now and do that. So let's just tidy up this exit and uh, let's just clear that. And then we're just going to remove this data again from there because we're going to generate that in a different way. 
we move the uh, database down, just tidy everything up and we start from fresh. So we've got that. So let's now go ahead and add some data. So let's just go back into the website, make sure we've got all the components that we need. So remember that we're going to go into one of these products here that doesn't work. So we're going to need the server on. And we're going to need to select an item and then we want to click the add basket. So what we want to do first is so when they click to the basket, like for example, Amazon, it will update the amount of items that are in the basket. And then when, when we go to the basket, we want to show the item has been selected and then the subtotal and how many of those items have been selected to be purchased. So we're going to be using Ajax here. Now I'm using jQuery, which um, isn't the most popular nowadays. Um, probably preferred now to vanilla JavaScript. Um, but we're just going to be using jQuery because it's nice and easy to utilize for Ajax, um, at least to begin with. And then you can go ahead and change this if you're comfortable with JavaScript, obviously. Uh, just change it into vanilla JavaScript or whatever kind of framework potentially you want to integrate in and use. So we're going to use Ajax. So the reason we're going to use Ajax is because of this. Let's remember that if I were to go here and add to basket, now that would send a request. We can make it send a request. So for example, if this was a form, we could send a request to the server. And then on the server side, we could create the code to add that item to the session. Now, the problem is here that because the data is stored in the back end, it needs to be sent to the front end. Now, we can't do that kind of asynchronous communication um, unless we've got the technology to do that. So Ajax, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, XML that is a tool that's going to allow us to send data to the server and retrieve data back without having to refresh the page. Now, of course, if we don't use Ajax, what we need to do, we need to submit or post the data to the server when we click on add to basket, and then we need to send the data back. And that normally means we need to refresh this page or send the user to another page so that they get the new session data. Now, so this is why we're using Ajax, because we want to send the data and return the data all on one little page here and then update this number here. Now, like I previously said, if we do this, it does mean that we're currently using the information from that Ajax um, return to update the page. Now, if we do refresh the page, remember, because in the background, we've also saved that request to the session, it means that the basket data and when we go to the basket and do that page, that will just get overridden to whatever is in the um, in the session at that point in time. And then we can just go ahead and use Ajax to add more and delete, etc. And again, we can then make the page respond to that. And then as soon as we refresh, it will be the same anyway, because that's the same information. It kind of mirrors what's already in the session data. So that's how we're going to approach this task in this project. So let's go ahead and start by let's uh, start by creating the functionality within the template. So of course we're going to need to start by going into the products and the single item because this is where we can actually can actually select the item that we want to use or oh, sorry add to the basket sorry. So what we're going to need to do is kind of retrofit this button here. Um, with some new information. So this is the button here that we're going to need to kind of um, deal with. And what's going to happen, someone's going to click on a button and then we're going to have a little bit of Ajax, which is going to detect that change or that click. And then it's going to actually then send across to the server some data that corresponds to the action that the user has just taken. So they've added something to the basket. So there's a few questions that we need to ask. Uh, first of all, the data that we send to the server what data do we need to actually send? Now, let's remember that we want to store in the session the fact that someone selected a specific um, book in this case, so a specific item. Now, that item, let's remember in the product table is that unique item is the product ID. So what we want to do is that when someone presses this button, we want to send the product ID to across so that we can add that, find that product and then add that product to the session data behind the scenes in the, on the server. So what we can do just to make it blatantly obvious, 
um, is that this button here after let's give it an ID first so we give it an ID so that it has a unique identification or a unique identifier that JavaScript can use to collect data from it or to kind of uh, monitor it so when we click this button Java behind the scenes knows that we click this button because it has an ID so we can then also add for example a value to this button so this value is going to represent in this case now remember we're sending the product data to this page because remember we're, we're getting out the product author the product title so we can also get the product ID so let's put the the product ID here so the product ID is going to be in the value and then what we can do when we press this button we can collect this ID remember this ID would diff be different depending on what product page we're on because this page is specific to that single item and will be dynamic so that whatever page you're looking at that product ID will correspond to that page and that item so now we can collect that and we can send that to the server and then behind the scenes we can then collect the item from the database based upon the ID and then we can update the session data to correspond to the product so we need the product name maybe uh, or the product price sorry that's what we're going to need so now we've done that now we need to detect the fact someone's actually uh, pressed that button so this is where we're going to be using uh, jQuery I just think it looks nice it's easy to explain and understand um, so just make sure um, this isn't going to work unless you've got in your base up the top here we've got I've got jQuery um, 3.5.1 min so some of the versions of jQuery doesn't ha don't have I think the slim versions don't have the Ajax implementation um, or facility so you're going to need the min version I think for top of my head so down here we're going to put it here we are eventually going to put this within the static JS so we're going to put this into one file because we might want to use this on multiple pages this piece of code so for code reusability it's probably better to do that but for now we're just going to add it right here so we're going to start off um, with obviously the script tags better do that first okay so um, we start off then um, with the dollar document on click so this document on click so when we click what we're going to click this button so we reference the button by the ID so the hashtag uh, add button so that's referencing this ID this element in the DOM so we can detect that someone's clicked on this button and then perform an action so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with um, let's just put in the um, e prevent default so it doesn't fire off unless we ask it to fire off so now we can start off with um, setting out the Ajax so we want to now make an Ajax request so let's do this there's a lot of brackets and so on here so um, just need to make sure that let's make it a bit bigger so we can actually see it uh, let's just um, make sure we're using the right syntax throughout so now we're going to make an Ajax request uh, so we're going to send some data to the server now and then return data and that's all going to be handled by about five lines six lines of code here so uh, what type of um, request do we want to make it's going to be a post so we're going to send a HTTP post or sorry not HTTP post we're going to send a post um, so get and post remember these type of tools that we have so post means we're going to send data to the server right so that's the type now we need the URL so where are we going to send this data so we're going to need to um, create a new URL now so let's send the data here to the basket basket add so that seems like a good idea right so um, let's just quickly build I oh, will do that in a second but that's where we're going to send the data right so obviously that's going to be connected to a URL that URL is going to be connected to a view behind the scenes so that's where we're going to send the data now we need the actual data right so let's um, build this up so what data are we going to send we're going to send the product um, ID we just call it product ID um, so let's just grab the ID now remember we've already set this up because we have set a value here of product ID so we can just capture that ID nice and easy so this is going to be um, 
this is going to be uh, add button. Is it the add button? I can't remember what I called now. So I've called this the ID, the add button. So basically, I'm just telling um, Java here to have a look for that element called that, and then just grab the value. So dot val. There we go. So just grab the value. So that's going to now record the the value, whatever the value is here. And that's obviously corresponding to the product ID, which is corresponding to the item that we're showing on the page. Right, so we're going to send that across. And then we also now are going to need the CSRF um, token. So to do this, we're just going to grab it. Now, this is something that may not work uh, in if you start to change this around. So we're going to need to send this token uh, for security reasons across. Otherwise, this won't work at all. Now, there's a few different ways of doing this. Um, this is going to work for this implementation here. Now, it's worth reading the documentation if you're doing something different here. Now, I don't ever recommend you turn this off. That's obviously the last resort. If you want to just try and get this working, you can turn the CSRF token off in Django. Um, so this is going to work. So we're going to send that across as well. And then we're going to need the action. And that action is going to be, in this case, just post. So that's uh, the action is just additional information which I can kind of um, test against or uh, query against to make sure I'm receiving the right type of um, request. So an action. So I'm just going to call that post. That's the action. Um, so there we go. I think uh, we're done there. So that's basically sending. Now, obviously, if we send some data, we are expecting to receive a response. So this is um, asynchronous, so success um, function. So what happens now is data returns. So I just need to reference that data as something. Normally it's in JSON format. So I'm just gonna call that JSON. You can call it whatever you like, it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna reference that data that is returned as JSON. So let's do that. And then of course, what I can also do is do something if there's an error. So I can capture an error. Um, Let's uh, just put something in place now. I do apologize for not fully um, fleshing this out. Uh, so we capture something there and we can do something if we want to. I'll let you, I'll let you decide what you want to do with that. And so we've got that. Um, so let's just make sure we've got that. And then we've got the error. And then I think we just need to close that up. Just following that along. Okay, so that closes and there we go. So that's pretty much in its entirety, the code that we need to write here. So um, I won't explain it again. I think it. Um, I've said everything I need to say. We're gonna send it off to this URL. We're gonna send that data. So now we can go to the uh, back end and capture this information. So we can see that we're going to be sending it to this URL. So the next step is obviously, let's make the URL, of course. So let's go into the basket and the URLs and let's make a new path. Um, so we're going to make a new view. We're going to call this basket underscore add. I might change this later because I might include the add and the delete in the same um, in the same URL seems like a better idea potentially uh, so name equals and then basket add okay so that's our new view so we can now go over to our views and let's make a new view let's call this uh oh let's call this uh basket add I guess and then we're going to take in the request as per normal Okay, so now we need to collect the data that's been sent to this view uh, from our page. Now, this is the data that we need to collect. Um, we've just got the product ID. So let's first of all just, um, well, we're going to need the session data, aren't we, at some point. So let's just grab the session data, uh, basket equals, because we want to... Um, we want to perform the action within the basket class, the adding to the adding to the session. Uh, so we're going to use basket. Now I have because I am doing this, I need to send in the request, of course. 
to it. So we just need to remember to do that. So what we're gonna to need to do, we're gonna to need to bring in that. So from new line from dot basket, we import in the basket. Okay, so that allows me and allows me to um, establish and uh, create the basket. And now what I'm gonna do is an if statement. So if request, so I'm gonna look at the request from the, the user. Now, if it's um, post and it's a get kind of request and the action, remember we spelt out the action. Uh, the action, so the action equals uh, post. So I could call it whatever I want there, but I'm just clarifying it's coming from this action. Um, so action um, equals post. So I'm basically just checking to make sure that the, re the request I've received from Ajax is a post request. And then also the action equals post. Now I can change that word post to whatever I want, of course, um, in the Ajax and then here. So if it is that, then obviously I wanna do something. So the first thing I want to do is I wanna get the product ID, right? Um, so I'm gonna collect the product ID uh, from, from the data. So I do that by creating a new variable here called product ID, and I wanna return an integer Okay, so specifically an integer, because so it is data that's being sent across. Um, this kind of helps kind of protect me also a little bit of security because I'm kind of going to convert this into an integer. It has to be an integer, has to be a number, else um, it won't be allowed to go any further. So post.get, I'm going to get the product ID, and that obviously matches the product ID that's here, right here. So this data, get this data, which is obviously the name or the ID of the, the product that I'm trying to save in the session. So now I've got the actual um, product ID. I can now actually find the product in the database. So I'm using get object or 404, which is really just a shortcut, right? For doing a kind of try accept. So this is literally a, a shortcut here in Django, the object 404 and doing something like this. So try product equals product objects, get ID equals product ID, except raise 404. So that's pretty much the same as that, but it's just a kind of a shorthand way of doing it. So let's um, bring it into our project. Now we're using it. There we go. Um, so that gets the actual product data from the database. Um, and now I guess what we can do is we can now save that to our session. So let's now bring in the the basket um, and we need to kind of um, add this now. So we're gonna need to add a new function inside the basket class called add. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to send some data to that class, so to perform the action. So product, um, product equals product. So we wanna send across the product information to this new function that we're gonna have in the class, the add function. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. We want to just send that data across. Now we found the product. Let's just send it across and do something with it, which is obviously now saving that data to our cookie. Sorry, to our fun, to us, uh, to our session. So let's just um, finish there, and let's now go into our basket class, and we're going to need to make a new function called add. There we go. So we want to take into this uh, self and also we are taking into this product. Okay, so we're passing product across, aren't we, from the view, product equals product. So now we can go ahead and get that product ID. So we sent across the product um, information. So we've gone into the information, we've got that ID and we've saved it now in product ID. Now what we can do now do is we can check to see if that user that is requested or has tried to add the product to their basket if that item actually exists within their basket. I guess we need to test that first. So if their product ID um, is not in the basket, so we're gonna get basket. So self baskets, where are we getting this from? Now this is a, remember we've created this, recreated this class in the views here. Um, and now what we've done is we're accessing this method here. So this add, 
Now we're using self basket, which can access this information here that's been set up. Now the basket is going to have um, the information about the user's session. So we're going to look in that basket to look to see if the product ID that we've collected from the user um, matches a product ID that's in their basket. And of course, um, if, uh, if, for example, uh, it does, then what we're going to do is we're going to go into that basket and then we're going to, sorry, if it doesn't, sorry, if it doesn't, it's getting late here. So, so if this doesn't exist in their basket, we're going to obviously create that entry. So, um, basket, uh, product ID. So we're going to set up this data. So it's, we're going to use the product ID that's going to be stored and then the actual then data. So this data is going to be referenced with the product ID. Um, so let's go in and add, um, for example, the price. So we want to store that, don't we? So price, so again, a dictionary. So, um, and this time the price is going to be collected again from the product that we've kind of, uh, you remember we're kind of, uh, sending in the product into the, um, this method here and we've collected the data. We've collected the product via the product ID that's been sent across. And now we move the product data inside of the, the add function here. So we're going to collect the product. Um, and that is going to be the price. So let's just, um, double check our model in the store, our store model. Where am I going? Store model. Um, so we've got the price. Yep. Yeah. So we're going to grab the price. So let's go back to our basket and we're going to put it right there. Okay. So that's pretty much all we need to do there. And now we need to save. So now we know how to add new data to the session. So again, what we're doing here is we're in self basket. Remember self basket equals basket, which is going to equal their current basket and any data that's inside of that basket. So we've accessed the basket that exists for that particular user. And now we've added data into it. Right. So now what we can now do is save it. So to save this, um, what we need to do is use a command uh, session modified. So we need to go ahead and we can use self dot. Uh, let's get the self session, which is a request session again. Uh, self session. And then we need to use modified. And that needs to equal true. So we basically just need to tell um, Django that we've modified the session. So if you do have a little bit of time to run through the documentation here in the topics HTTP sessions, it talks a little bit how about when sessions are saved. So by default, Django saves the session database when the session has been modified. So that's when any dictionary values have been assigned or deleted. So we're using session modified to, uh, I guess, explicitly tell Django that we have made modifications. There we go. So if you get a bit of time, read through that. If you are following this code line by line, there's two extra changes I've made because I've forgotten earlier. In the URLs, I've added a path in this case, just add for the basket add. So I needed to add that. And then in addition to that, if we go into the view, the basket view, you'll notice that we are using the product table here, but I didn't actually import it in. So what I've gone ahead and done is from the store models, that's where the product database, database databases, uh, store models, and then import the product table. Okay, now then let's get back into the view and we're now going to build a response. So just to begin with, let's just go ahead and build a response. So response equals, and we're going to format this into a JSON. We we'll use a JSON response here and use a dictionary. Um, so we're going to just send some data back. Let's just uh, build something, um, test data. So we're just going to return that for now. What we are going to return back in actual fact is going to be the new updated um, basket quantity. 
and also the total price potentially but um, that would be for the um, the basket page now for the page that we're on the product page we just need to really return the the cart or the sorry the basket quantity the amount of items we have in our basket so we'll sort that out in a minute so let's just build a response and then go ahead and return that response to the user okay so we're using json response here formatting this uh formatting the return here into this kind of dictionary format here um key value so let's go ahead now and just import in the json response uh from the django http so let's just go ahead and do that okay so we're going to bring that resource in and do that so this is just a way of returning the data in a format that we can then utilize with in javascript i guess that kind of bakes it down the reason why we're using json response here okay so now we have that in place let's go ahead now and test this out so first thing first then let's uh, go into the website and let's just uh, refresh let's get a new session id uh, we're going to need to turn the server on of course so we run that we get a new session id so we use that session id now to go into the database and to access this session data so we're going to need to go into the shell let's go into the shell let's make a new window here uh, py manage by shell now let's just grab the database so import the session database and now we can go ahead and get the data via the session id that we've just collected from the browser there and now we can go ahead and decode now there shouldn't be anything in this data at the moment so look there's nothing there because we haven't actually saved any data so let's go ahead and add to the basket so we just added to the basket there some data so one would imagine if we then uh, collect the data again so we're going to need to get the data again from the database save it in this variable let's go ahead and decode and there we go so we have item 3 id 3 of the product and price is 10. now at the moment i think that is 10 pounds so <laughs> excuse me let's go ahead and have a look at the database so this is the apologies for the naming here AESD, ADSD. So uh, that's the, the product. It's the React product. So let's go into the shop. Just double check this. Bring this down. Okay, so we've got our products, SDSD. This is now to work out what item number it is, we could add the ID here to this list in the admin. But if I just move my mouse over, you probably can't quite see at the bottom left hand corner you'll see the uh, the the url and there'll be a number inside of it and i can see that on mine at least it's number three so it's definitely number three and how much does it cost 10.99 okay so there's clearly an issue here at the moment um looks like i'm outputting it as an integer so i may need to kind of uh, deal with this slightly different so it outputs the 10 and the 99 pence so this is probably an easy one to fix here because you can see that i entered the data in the price as an integer so let's remember that the integer is going to be a whole number so therefore the 10 is being registered um, or recorded in the product price so we're going to need to change that let's change that to for example a string uh, so we're going to print out the full price here now this isn't a number that we're going to be calculating um, at the moment so uh, we can just use a string here we're just going to output the string um, so let's go ahead and try that so let's um, let's go back and grab this data and put it in our session again so we're going to need to uh, go into the the site um, let's go ahead now and just uh change we'll clear our cookie refresh we'll create a new um create a new session id key sorry um and i'm going to a product and we just add that to the basket so that should add it to the session data for this session id so now we can go ahead again and just we're going to grab this data once more and this then should complete this phase and then we can move on slightly so let's go back into our code 
uh, we're going to now, we're going to grab the, the database again. Um, this time we're going to get a new entry, which is the new code that I've just uh, copied from the browser. And this time we're going to decode it again. We should have the full price. There we go. So I do apologize if this is super slow um, going forward. Uh, I'll speed up and I'll slow down in different components of this. I know that I get comments saying it's too fast. Some will say it's too slow. And I think it's better to be too slow because on YouTube, if you haven't already found that button, you can just speed up the video anyway. So that's all good. So now that we have that in place, hopefully you've got a, a good or you maybe you've got a clear overview now of what exactly is happening here. And what I said previously about, we're just building a CRUD system here. We're going to add to the session, delete from the session, update the session. Hopefully that kind of makes sense now what we're doing. We're just updating the session data with new information. Now you can see here, I've got product one. That's the product ID in the, in the database and then the price. So obviously what we're going to also need to record now is the quantity. So I purposely um, programmed it this way because you can now stop the program or the video sorry and you can have a go yourself to see if you can actually now just add in the other item of data the quantity so hopefully you've had a go at trying this what we're going to do now is add the quantity to the session data as well as the fact that the user has added the product to the basket so we want to record the quantity now this quantity if we have a look up here this is using a select option here uh, so this has an id of select so we can keep that the same so what we need to do is create a little bit of code here let's just test to make sure we can select so what we can do is just run this console log now similar to what we've done here we've um, selected the add button value um, this time we're going to um, select the option selected, the text. So that's the text here. So we're going to select one of these options here. We can select the value if we wanted to. So we could just add the value here. Um, either, either, um, either one will be okay as long as we select the data. Um, that's absolutely fine. Uh, so that hopefully is then going to select the text. Now, now I'm doing a console log here because when I go into the code, I can refresh. And then I can just check to see if I'm actually selecting the data. Looks like I am. So quantity two, quantity one, and so on. So I'm selecting that once I add to the basket. So that looks like it's working okay. So all I need to do now, of course, is move this across, take that out, and then put it down here. So you can see that I've started to do this. Um, there we go, make sure there's a comma at the end, of course. So this is product quantity. So now I'm sending across via Ajax, product ID and product quantity. So now what we need is to do is capture that information and put it into the session data. So the first thing that we need to do, of course, is just select the data. Now we know this is gonna be an integer again. So let's just, uh, we've selected the product ID here. So let's just select the product quantity in exactly the same fashion. So this is going to be product underscore underscore quantity. Um, that's all good. So now what we need to do is add that to our basket. So product equals product. Uh, we want to send that data into the add so that we can collect the ID of the product. And we also want to now send through the, uh, the product quantity. So Let's do that product quantity. There we go. Okay, so let's, um, what am I doing? There we go, product quantity, sorry. Uh, so now we've got that, let's send that across. And now we can go into the basket. Let's uh, collect that information. So product and product quantity. So now we have that in here. We can now also add that to our session so we've got the price and we have a, a comma here and then let's add in the quantity so let's just call this quantity and then this can of course be a string or an integer we could use an integer uh, so this is going to be the product quantity Okay, so now what we need to do is just make sure this works by going into the page. Let's go into our application, just remove our cookie, refresh the page. 
and make sure the server is turned on. Maybe we've got an error here. It looks like we do have an error. Uh, so basket add um, product product and uh, positional argument follows keyword argument. Okay. So let's just add a value here. This is gonna make it a lot easier actually. Let's um, quantity equals uh, product uh, quantity. Uh, so now we can go back into our basket. Let's just change this to quantity. And then in addition to that, we can change that to quantity there. And let's have a look to see if this works. So we're gonna refresh, we're gonna get our session ID Okay, so new session ID. Um, let's just add to the basket, make sure we've got some new data. Let's go back here. Um, now it's gonna be a new session ID. So we just need to, let's just go ahead and just grab that database again. And then just uh, get the session with the new session ID. And let's just take a look at the key. And there we go, so we now have a quantity. So we've now gone ahead and we've added the price and the quantity to the session data. So of course, now we have the quantity, we can now send back the quantity to the front end, of course, and that's what we want to show in the basket. So we do this progressively. Of course, we need to make a calculation at some point when we've got multiple items. So let's just do this with First of all, the quantity here. So the response that we want to now return is going to be the quantity. And that is gonna be whatever's in the product quantity. Okay, so now we're returning this value quantity and that's going to, um, that's going to be recording the quantity, the product quantity that we've added. And that obviously then is going to appear in the front end or now gonna be available via the front end here. So that's what we're storing here in JSON. So let's do console.log and let's just go ahead and put JSON in there. So just so we can see the value. So um, let's go into our console, refresh. So let's add two items. There we go. So now we're returning back via um, the JSON request, the quantity two. So now what we can do is update our basket number here with the actual quantity. So um, let's remember in the base. So let's go into the base here. Let's have a look in our base where this information is being recorded. Um, so we're looking for the end here, the basket. So what we want to do is we want to um, capture this div here. Um, so let's just give this an ID. Let's call this ID equals uh, basket, basket quantity. Okay, so that's the ID of this div. So what we can now do is replace this number with the number that's returned. Now, although we're not working on this page, of course, this will get um, rendered with the single page. So we can still capture and add this because this will be loaded in the DOM. Um, so we can access this ID here, this um, element and change this number. So basket quantity. So let's go back into the single here. Now we're just gonna write a piece of code here, which is going to select the element basket quantity and update it with this value. So let's go ahead and select the element. So document uh, dot, let's get the element, element uh, by ID. So we're gonna select it by ID. Um, and then the ID that we're looking for is basket uh, quantity. That's the ID that we've specified. Um, so we want to go into that element, into the inner HTML and we want that to equal JSON, HTML. We want that to equal the JSON data. And inside the JSON data, we've got the quantity currently. So let's go ahead and do that. So now that should replace the inner HTML, the, the number with the new data that's returned. So let's give this a go and refresh our page. 
Uh, let's add four. And now the basket should register four. There we go. So that's now in place. Now, of course, what we also now want to do is when we refresh the page, and we also want that to now hold as four. So that's where the information is going to get returned from the session uh, data. So obviously when we refresh the page, we send a request to the server, the server captures the session data and puts it onto the template for us and then sends it back to us. So let's go ahead and sort that out. So let's head over to the basket and let's add a new function here, which actually is dedicated to working out or calculating the quantity within our basket. So what we're going to do here is uh, yeah, basically count all the items, aren't we? So uh, let's go ahead and start this up. So we want to basically um, count or we want to uh, get the basket data and count the quantity of items. So um, let's just return. So we're going to return um, a sum. Now we want to basically get the the item um, quantity. So quantity. So we're looking for um, the quantity within our item, and we want to then. say for item for each item um, in the self dot basket dot uh, values okay so what we're doing here then is we're basically going to iterate um, over the basket we're going to look for the item quantity where the item quantity exists, so for where the item quantity exists um, in the basket, um, we're basically going to um, add it up. So we're just going to create a sum of it. Simple as that. I say simple as that. Hopefully that makes sense. I'll say it once again. So basically what we're going to do here in brackets of a sum. So we're going to create a sum here. So we're going to look for the item quantity. So we specify item quantity. That's obviously this item here in each of the session um, in each of the session data, because you might have multiple rows, rows, multiple, multiple items, sorry, in the basket. So for each one of these, for each item that we find quantity, um, we're going to get that quantity data. Because remember, we've got um, key value here. So we're going, that's the key. So what we want to do is calculate the values. So we're basically returning the, um, the sum of all the values put together calculated. And that then returns and then counts everything. So let's um, now call this in our template. So now we can head over to the base template. And now what we need to do is think about, well, we've got an instant here, instance here where the user goes to the website. There is nothing in the basket. OK, so we need to show zero. So we need to count to make sure that the user doesn't have anything in the basket. We've obviously created that functionality here. We're counting, so we need to call that in. Now, if this equals um, less than zero, or zero, sorry, um, then obviously we want to show zero in the basket. So if it equals more than zero, we obviously want to show that value. So what we're going to do here is with, and now we want to get the total quantity. So we're going to restore the total quantity in this variable total quantity. Now, you need to be careful here of white space. Um, so Keep it nice and close. So I think a white space will break this. It won't work. So uh, that's going to equal basket. Now, remember, basket is coming from the context processor here, that data that's connected to the template. And so we're collecting the basket from the context processor on this page. Now we can um, find out the length. So that's essentially then going to call this function here and work out the, the quantity, as I explained earlier. Now then we can go ahead and end that with. Now, what we want to do is create an if statement. So if the total quantity is more than zero, we want to obviously show the value that's stored in the session. So we end it and then we bring in our statement again as per normal, our element, sorry. And then this time inside of the element, we're going to have the total quantity. 
that's um that's what we've um just grabbed here from the basket length so we're going to show the total quantity now obviously if it doesn't if the if statement isn't uh, more than zero we're going to show zero because there's nothing currently in the basket okay so that's the logic there let's go back into our template and let's just test this out so i'm going to refresh so i've got two items in my basket so let's just clear that and then refresh the page we have zero okay so let's add something in our basket we now have oh there seems to be an error um okay cannot set property in a html of null Ooh. okay so there seems to be an issue here um let's just go back um div basket total quantity um that's a bit of a strange one i wasn't expecting that cannot set property in a html of null okay but you can see when we refresh the page it is being updated at the moment with the data from the session but it looks as though um, when we have a zero character a null um, it doesn't seem to give us the opportunity to actually change the basket that's interesting okay one second and let's uh, do this again so let's just clear this refresh so when we have a zero it seems to cause an issue an error uncall error type cannot set in a property sorry set property in a html of null now a problem like this or sorry should i say an error like this normally indicates that for example the javascript is potentially running or before sorry or after the event so we can't actually then capture but if you look at more specifically at the code here um, it's fairly obvious um, what the problem is remember what we're trying to do with the ajax at the end of the ajax we requested um, to find the element by id basket query now the problem is here if you look at the code or well, the base code here we've detailed the element here but we haven't here so we just need to remember um, that we're going to need to put the value inside of the element so let's uh, go ahead and take this element out uh, let's put it before the if statement let's take this div out so let's do, do this before the if statement so now what we have if we just line this up nicely um, inside of this div um, in a html here we're going to either present the total quantity or zero so now we can actually capture this zero and replace it with the ajax uh, request there so let's go back in refresh our page and let's request two that works so let's just um, go back to where we were clear that and refresh now we have zero again that was the issue wasn't it so let's add three and there we go so clearly this is all working now all good so let's go ahead now and just add a new product so that's beginners so let's go into react let's see if we can add a separate product so let's add three of these so we've got three in the basket let's add three of these books um, and we're going to refresh the page now notice what happened there the problem we're having is that we're not returning the quantity of the books but you can see when we refresh the quantity of books is correct so what we're going to now need to do is utilize this new function we created in the basket and return it in our view so what we return is the actual quantity the total quantity and not just the single product um, that we're that we're adding at that particular point so now what we need to do is the quantity needs to equal uh, the the total quantity so we can go ahead and maybe just add a new variable here called basket um, quantity and then that's going to equal the basket and then let's just calculate that um, so now what we can do is we can add that quantity into the quantity here there we go um, that should be okay so we've got the add oh sorry and um, we don't want it there do we uh, apologies, apologies that goes into the add to actually kind of add the item uh, so we want to put it just here that's the response so let's just uh, remove that from here uh, so now we've got the uh, response data so we're going to collect the response data from our class 
uh, calculate that all up and then return the basket quantity. That's the updated quantity based upon all the items we have in the basket. So let's just try this again. I'm going to clear that, start from fresh. So we have nothing in the basket. I'm going to add four of these books here. We've added four of those books. Let's now go for the Django. Notice that it persists because I'm on a new page and now it's taking the data from the session, which is obviously four. So let's go into the beginner's book. Let's add two of these books. Now it's at, um, calculating six. We've got six items now in the basket. If I refresh, it maintains six. So there we go. That's adding items to our session. So you might want to take a break because well, we're about four hours in now and we've added items to the session. Uh, so we've gone through the setup, we've created a session, we've looked at uh, them building the context processor. So we have site-wide access to our session data. And now we've gone through the process of adding the data to this session. Great. Okay, so welcome to part two of the session development stage. So now we're going to have a look at deleting the session data. So in this stage, we're going to, first of all, view all the items in the basket. So we're going to need to set up the basket template so we can view all the items we have in the basket. And then we need to add a delete button and then create the Ajax so that we can request to delete the item. So we're going to need to create a new URL for that. And then that will pass over to the view. We build the view so that we can then pass that over to the basket class. And then we we'll add a new function in the basket class to delete the data. And then finally, because again, we're using Ajax and we want everything to happen instantly, we're going to need a bit of JavaScript to remove the element from the basket or the item from the basket, but obviously the div um, that's containing the data of the item on our page and then remove the item. And then of course, when we refresh the page, obviously the new list will appear the same. And there we have the function of deleting the session data or an item from our basket. So first of all, we're going to head over to the summary, the basket summary. That's where we're going to see all the items that we've put in our basket in a nice little list before we can then purchase them. So let's have a look at this template here. Now we'll just go ahead and extend from the base as per normal, load static. We've not really sorted that yet, but we're going to load that anyway. And then we're just going to override the title in the base. Remember extending from the base here. So we're extending and overriding the title with the basket summary. Now we have the content block. So we're going to override the content block of the base or add in, uh, extend from the base content block. Uh, so this is the main section here. You can see that we're going to use a container to restrict the width of the page. We've got a heading and then we're going to create some loops here so we can loop over the data in the basket. So we're going to call that basket where well, there's two T's there. So basically for any item that's in our basket, um, we basically want to um, get the item information. Now what we're doing here in actual fact, remember, this is the basket. This is going to show the product name, the product price, maybe some product details, other product details. So we're not iterating over the actual basket session data here. We want to iterate over the um, the items that are in the basket, the actual data from the database. So remember in the session, we're recording and we're storing the ID of each item that's in the database. Um, in our session data. So what we need to do is take the session data and look at all the IDs of all the products we've stored in our basket, all the IDs, that's the ID of the products. And then we want to run that against the actual database and extract from the database all the items that we have in our basket. And then we want to iterate over those to then display the items in our basket. So hopefully that makes sense put data or put items into our basket. We record the ID, the actual ID that's a reference point to the data in the database for those particular products. We then want to iterate over our session data and extract from the database the items that we've actually selected to be purchased. And we want to then output that data in a nice little list and show all the items that we want to purchase. So that's what we're going to do here. Now there's a little bit of setup for that. Now the rest of this template, it's just a standard template um, that we utilized in the previous, in the previous 
template here, the single template. So all I've done is basically just copy that over a bit. And you can see here, I'm just going to output the price, the image as per normal, um, as we did previously, as well as kind of the quantity. So we can update the quantity. I've got two buttons. Um, I've got the add button that I've added here. We'll look at that shortly and tie that up. And then we've got the delete button too. So we're going to need a bit of that. Um, yeah, it's just a simple, sorry, I use the word simple again. It's just a template. I do apologize. I did promise a, one of our community members, I wouldn't say simple anymore. Um, so then we've got the, at the end here, we've got the subtotal. So we're going to need to get the total price. We're going to need to sort that out shortly. And there we go. So that's the template there for the summary. Have a look in the repository yourself and just go through that if you're not familiar with HTML and CSS. Um, so let's go now through creating the iterable data. So let's move over to the view. Now we've got that. So we've already created the URL for this. If you remember, that's where we we can see the page. Um, that's the, the route here. That's going to take us to the basket summary. So that's already set up to take us to the view, to the basket summary. Okay, so I've added, let's remove that. Uh, I've added the basket in, um, so we can grab the basket session data. And you can see that I'm pushing across the basket data back. Right, so what we need to do here now is create a create the, the class. Remember, we're instantiating the class here. We're creating a copy of the class here. That's what we're doing in object-oriented terms. That's what we're doing right here. Um, so let's go into the class that we're building, the basket. Um, so what we need to do is make this class into an iterable so that we can iterate over data. So what we can do is, uh, where can we put it? Maybe just here. Um, we're going to create a new function um iter okay so we're going to create an iterable uh, essentially we're going to use this function here uh, to create an iterable class okay that doesn't quite summarize it we're we're using this um iter function uh, to return an iterator for this object so this allows us to, when we ask to iterate over this object, um, this function is going to run. I think that's one way to kind of summarize it. Because at the moment, what we can't do, we can't take the data from the session and just kind of iterate over it because we need to collect the data from the database to iterate over. So this is kind of a handy function for that. So let's go ahead now and finish this off. So we're gonna bring in self as per normal. So let me try and explain what's going to happen here. Right, so we need to iterate over the keys that are in the basket. So we've gone ahead now, the user has added an item to the basket, therefore we now have session data. In that session data, we know we have recorded the price, uh, which is a string at the moment, inside the data, and also the quantity. And also we're using the key, the product ID as the key. So what's stored in our session data is that type of format there. We have the product ID, which is the key to the data here. We have this key value situation here. So the price and whatever the price is and the quantity, that's what we're recording in the session data. So what we want to do now is we need to collect data uh, from the date, the products database about the product. So we can display that information in our, in our basket list. So first of all, we need to work out what items, what um, products we want to show. So we're going to collect the keys. So we're going to get all the keys. Um, the key here, we set up the key, which is the product IDs within our session data. We're going to grab those and then we're going to put it into this variable product IDs. That's the first thing. So now we have all the IDs, the product IDs, so we can then query against the database. So now we can run this query here. So we're going to run the product so we bring in the product uh, database. So from store models, we bring in the product database. Now we were using this custom manager here called products. That means it's gonna only return data where products are flagged as active. So I thought it might help us actually just to kind of visualize what's going on here. Uh, so we've got session data. So in our, in our session data, 
we currently have um, a few different fields. Now, first of all is the ID. Um, that's the ID of the product. Inside of here, we've got some other data. Um, for example, the price. And we're also storing uh, the other parameter. We're also storing in here, just very quickly, is the quantity. Okay, so we're also storing the quantity. So what we're gonna do now, um, so we might have multiple um, multiple items stored here in the session data. So this is my session data. I'm, I've added two items to my data, to my basket. And basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop round first and collect these numbers. So I'm gonna put that into a variable. So in my variable, I've now have two IDs stored in this variable. So then what I can now do is take those numbers there and I can basically tell Django to have a look in the products, in the products uh, table for these um, products. So remember in the products table, we have an ID field for each product, which is unique. So we're basically just extracting out um, the products uh, from the products table that represent the IDs that are in our session data. Maybe that was useful for you. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. So products equals, we're gonna use um, the products table. We've got a custom manager products that returns by default uh, only products that are set to active. Um, and then we're gonna use the filter. So essentially here in SQL world, that will be uh, a where kind of clause where the ID of the products um, is one of the IDs that we've collected from our session data. So next up, we have all that data now ready. And what we also want to do is we want to copy the basket data. So we're gonna copy an instance of our session data. And because remember our session data already has data in there for us. It already has everything that the user has selected. So what we need to do is take that data and it's nicely formatted in a way that we can iterate over it. Um, we're gonna take that data add some more data to our, our basket um, data. And that's gonna be the product information so we can extract the image and other information about the product. And then we can add in some more data where we can do some calculations. Because if, for example, someone has selected four items, uh, we want to calculate four times the number or the, the price of the product to get kind of a subtotal of all those um, items that they've selected. Okay, so we make a copy then. So all we've done is made a copy now of the session data. We've collected the products and now they're ready. Um, now we need to kind of stitch this together. So what we're gonna do now is basically take the existing basket and add, amend um, the information that's inside of it to add some more information to it. So we're gonna do this via this um, for loop here. So you can see the products. So we're gonna loop through products now. So when we loop through products, we're gonna get the basket and we're gonna add some more data. So for every item that we've extracted from the database, um, we're now going to kind of loop through, because remember our basket holds say item one and two. Now we've extracted from the database item one or two. So when we loop through products, we'll also loop through the basket and then we'll be able to add the specific data to that specific item because they're in the same order. So let's loop through the products and add or amend some data to our basket here. And you can see what I'm gonna do is add some new items. So this is gonna be string product ID. So this is kind of matching the product ID that's inside the basket. Um, so I'm getting the, um, the product ID. So that's gonna match the product ID in the basket. Then I'm gonna add some additional data to my, my basket, the individual items in my basket. So first of all, I'm now gonna create this key called product and I'm gonna include the data product. So remember that when we loop through the data, this is the data coming from the database, and that's all the data about that item from the products database. We put that into this, as we loop through, that goes into this variable here called products, and product, sorry, and then we can utilize that within our loop to access the products, individual product data. So there might be four products here, Every time we loop round, the first item gets placed into this variable product. Now we run the loop. So we select um, the product ID from our basket and we add some more data. We're gonna call it product. And then the data we insert is all the product data that we've selected from the database about that individual item. 
So now we've just extended that, we can now do another loop almost and add some more data. So what we can now do is for example, for uh, have a look at the basket values. So we can select maybe individual values inside of this, uh, inside of this data. So what we got here is um, item price. So inside of our basket data, we've got an item called price. Remember we set it up here and we're storing the price of the product. Now at the moment we're storing it as a string. So that doesn't allow us to calculate. We can't um, make any calculations here on a string. We're gonna need to change the format of that price in this case to a decimal. So we've imported the decimal in at the top here. So that's all uh, now inserted. Now we've got that um, translated this price into a decimal. It means we can run a calculation. Now the calculation we want to run is um, we want to add now a new item within our basket and then let that include, we're now gonna include some more data, sorry, into our basket. Um, it's gonna be called total price. Now this exists. So we're just kind of um, taking that data out and then transforming that into a decimal. And now we're gonna add some more data and that's basically gonna be called total price. So when we extract the data from our data that we've returned to our template, we can, ex we can capture that information um, by the reference here, total price. Now the total price is going to equal the, to the item price, which is now a decimal times the quantity. Now that item quantity already exists within this data that we're setting up here. Um, so remember the item we've already added, or the quantity, sorry, we've already added, it's an integer um, already, so we can make that calculation, item times, in, um, item price times item quantity. So we're just looking and looping through every item within our basket data, and we're gonna run and perform this action. And then we're going to return um, item. Okay, so when we loop through this in the template, we can access data through the keyword item and also you'll see product as well. So we can, um, we have a number of different options here, but hopefully that makes sense uh, to kind of give you a bad visual on what's going on here if you, that doesn't make sense. And I do apologize if I'm just talking too much here, but um, we've got our session data Um, say so that was like one and that was the quantity say so was one the quantity and then the price 10 pound so that's what we started off with and uh, we had the the quantity uh, the price this is the data that we're storing in our session and then the id of the the product so all we've done is we've in the first step we've added the individual product information so we've taken the product information and basically we've just extended this information set to now include the the product information and that in that's the data that's from a database so we know that there's an there's an image data there's a description data and so on so we can collect all that now and that now goes into our session or into our session data um, that we're kind of we've copied across and now preparing to be looped out and then we've gone ahead and just added some more data and this time about the kind of the total the total quantity so what we've done is we've kind of looped around um, the data that's in our products um, session data here that we've copied across and there might be multiple items and we just loop through and every time we loop through we just capture the um, the price and the quantity so we capture the price and the quantity and of course we've translated the price from a string to a decimal so that we can times the quantity times the price uh, to return whatever the, the price will be, the total price, after we've added the, the quantity and the price of the product together. So that's then kind of attached. That information is then also, we've kind of run out of space there. That information, once we loop through, is also now attached to our data at the end here. So we now have the, also the total quantity. So we've kind of built this big uh, data structure here um, and that will be for every single item that we have in our in our session uh, data in our basket. And then, of course, now what we can do is we can just kind of iterate over those and display it on the page or in the template.
So let's go back into our template here and try and determine what's happening here. Because if you remember here, what we're doing is we're running this for uh, loop and a kind of a with iterator as well. So, um, so for item in basket, so we know that there's multiple potential multiple items in basket. So this for loop here is obviously looping round and for each item in the basket is going to print out the item. Okay. So let's just uh, take away these, this with here and let's just go for the four. So to try and um, in kind of simple terms, understand what this is performing. The four here, if I refresh, I've added some items to my basket. You can see that when I add the items to the basket, uh, let's just go for the react book. Um, you can see that when I add to the basket, it is looping through all the items. So it's identifying and finding all the items, but you can see that none of the data is available okay the price is there but there's that just ignore that so none of this data is there should be a title here there should be an image and um, we should show the quantity that's selected um, so the data isn't available so we need to kind of dig down a little bit further and extract that data so this is what the the with is for so with product equals item so we have to go into the item here and then essentially run product and what that is doing, I guess we could say what that is doing is, is initiating um, the, the the loops here to kind of collect the data um, from the database and go through these um, two steps here where we're adding the more more data to the um, the session data to produce a final data set, which we can then utilize to print out all the data about that particular item. So this is why we take this next step here. And now what we can do is have a look at the template here. And we can now see that we are outputting the image from product, the product title. So it's important if you're not familiar with this type of thing, remember we're putting all that information into this uh, key here, product to print out individual items. So this, we need to refer to the data via product here. Now, what we can also do, you'll notice here, we can also refer to the data via item as well. So directly from uh, item here. So that's why you are seeing um, data um, earlier there, because we can also refer to the data via the item. So we've gone through that and I've just outputted what I need to output, um, the quantity and so on. So let's go back and see if this works. So we're going to refresh and notice now all the information is now being placed on our shopping basket. So um, let's just uh, select multiples. You can now see it is also collecting the quantity. So, and it is also tallying up here um, the subtotal of four. So four times whatever this Django book costs is going to cost us 83 pounds. So here you might want to change, you might not want this. You might just want to here include the actual original price and then just have the subtotal or the total at the end. So you can see what we're going to need to do next. We're going to need to just make a total at the end here. So that's going to be the next step. But hopefully you can now see how to iterate uh, and create new data within the session data by copying it, adding new data from the database and matching that data up, and then also iterating over that information. So to get the total, maybe we can add a new method here in the basket where we collect the total. Um, that could work. What we might want to do now, in actual fact, is kind of turn this um, function here. Maybe we use this function to return both the um, the basket value and the the total quantity. That could be useful. Um, but we're going to, I think, make a a new function here. Um, so let's go ahead and create a total function. So I'm just going to call this uh, get total price for example so there's a few ways i can think about doing this i'm um, just trying to make it obvious at this point uh, so now uh, we're going to return so we just need to think about what we're going to return so we want to get the total price so we need to loop through um, each item in the basket we need to loop through the values um, of each item and we need to get the item price and the item quantity for each item. So similar to what we've done here in actual fact. So sum, um, this is going to be a, a decimal, remember, because we're storing the price originally as 
a, a string. So let's uh, go ahead and get the first item, which is the price. Okay, so we get the price and now we need to times that against the, we times that by the quantity. So item uh, quantity, that needs to be in the singles. And then, so we're gonna do that for, for um, item in self dot basket. So we're gonna look for the basket values. There we go. So we can look in the basket for the values, uh, grab the price and the quantity, and then basically just times them all up. And there we go, that's our sum. Okay, so we're gonna call that now. Uh, let's go into our view. Let's just call that in our view here. So um, let's just return. Yeah, let's just um, let's just return this back. So within our template, uh, we can call it directly. Uh, so let's go back down here. Um, so we've already written the code. It looks like uh, so, but in the basket, get total price. Now let's just uh, double check the naming. Get total price looks okay um let's just um let's just format that okay i was expecting a wrap then um okay so let's um we've now gone into the summary template and inside of our template here you can see we've got the pound sign whatever you need and then we're going to call it from the basket uh, get total price okay so let's go back in our our page uh, let's do refresh and there we go we now have our subtotal so 83 plus 15 plus 10 is 110 pound and 94 pence so we now have our total in place now that's something you might also want to kind of print here or put into your basket um, same code that you use in the summary um, page here to to do that now you need to remember that this this button here, this code is coming from the context processor. So you're going to need to add that to your potentially your context processor. Um, oh, you so you won't. So you're accessing the basket, sorry, from the context processor. Uh, so you'll be able to access um, that data from the context processor if you want to kind of add the price here in that area. And there we go. So that phase is now finished. We now have our basket in place. We can now add items to the basket. We've calculated all the items in the basket and all those details. And now we can start thinking about a delete button. Now the process here is gonna be very similar to what we've done previously. Hopefully you'll become a little bit more familiar now with things, so maybe I can speed up a little bit. So we're gonna create some Ajax on our basket page. Um, and we're going to create a button that's connected to that Ajax. So when the user presses that button, we're going to send a message asynchronously to the back end to our view. We're going to capture that in our view. And then we're going to go ahead and in our basket class, we're going to add a new function called delete. We're going to delete it from our session data. And then we need to update the basket template to remove that item instantly. So remember we're working asynchronously here. So we do want it to kind of remove um, without having to refresh the page. So of course, when we do refresh the page, the session data is updated anyway, so it won't show it on that page. So that's what we're going to do next. So like I said, this should look fairly familiar if we've gone through the same, if you've gone through the same phase earlier where we added or created an add button. So let's just um, confirm here. Uh, we've got a button and we've called this the delete button. Um, so we created a simple button here called delete. Now we've given it an ID of delete so we can capture the, the fact that someone's pressed that button. And we've also got a value, which is the product ID. Because of course we want to know what we want to delete from the session data. So the product ID is obviously the key that's used in the session data. So that's our delete button. So now we need to go to the bottom here. Now I do want to eventually kind of move across all this all of this JavaScript inside of a JavaScript file here. And that's probably a task that I do at the end. 
Uh, so let's just go through and get it working first. So in our in our home here, no, sorry, in our single page, we have a script that's already pre-written. That's our Ajax script from earlier. So let's just put that into the summary here, the basket summary. And we're just going to put that before the end block. There we go. So now when the user clicks on not the add button, the delete button ID. So let's um, change that to delete. We're now going to send some data across. And this time it's actually much easier because all we need to do is um, add a new URL for delete. So we can do that. We could just use the add. Now let's not forget that we could just capture this because what we're doing is using action. So let's just don't confirm what I mean by that. So if you wanted to in your view, I will separate it for now, but in your views, instead of having two functions here for add and delete, remember what we're doing is we're capturing the request, the Ajax request, and we're also matching the action word, action equals post. So here the action equals post. But what we can do is we can change that to, um, for example, action equals delete. And then what we can do here is our if statements, we can create two if statements. We can reuse code um, if we reorganize this so we're not calling things twice. We're not repeating code anywhere because when we make a new function called basket delete, we are going to be repeating some of this code. So potentially we could just use one function to do that. And that is something again, I might do at the end as an added task for those who want to do that. But we're just going to keep this simple for now and add a new function here in a short time. So that's what this action is for. Hopefully that makes sense. So we're going to keep that with post at the moment. Oh, so we're going to actually, we are going to change that to delete. Oh no, we don't need to. We don't need to. Sorry, 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 sorry. Not the moment. Okay, so what we need to do is we only need to send across um, the ID. That's pretty much all that we need to do at this point. So that's the ID. We're going to need the um, CRF token. So just make sure that's in and post. So the first thing you can see that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to build a URL so that we can send this action, this request along to the right place. So we're not going to need that there in this success because we're going to, need to change that in a minute. OK, so that will now capture the delete um, button. So when we press delete, it's going to send that request over that data uh, request over to um, the delete URL. So the product ID, yep, um, is the add button value. So remember, we're catching the value here. So the value equals the product ID. So that's the data that we're sending across. Good. Right, so it's going to be called delete basket uh, URL. So let's just get rid of all this. Um, so let's go into our basket URLs. And now underneath add, let's just copy and paste this and change it to delete. So I think I might need to also just change. Let's just check this template again. Um, we send it in the right place. Yeah, OK, basket delete. So we're going to be sending it here. So you can see that we're going to create a new view called delete. Yep. And then let's go into the views here. And let's now add a new function called basket delete bring in the request. Um, so right, so it's the same type of process here. We're going to instantiate the uh, basket. We're going to copy the basket to so we can access that information. And then we're going to need the if statement. So check to see if it is a from the action that we're expecting, in this case post. So we can change this to add and delete or whatever we want. Remember that's just the action in the in the in the Ajax request. Right, so now we need to um, collect the product ID from the Ajax request data. So let's grab that ID. Good. And now we need to, well, we do, all we need to do now is build a new function in our, in our basket class. So we're now going to um, delete. So we're going to make a, um, a delete function in our basket class. Now basket.delete then product equals product. Now this time we just want to record the product ID. 
we don't need to necessarily send across like we did before the actual product information. We just need the ID so that we can look through the keys of our session data and delete it from our session data. So we've got the product ID here that the user has selected. So let's just um, let's just add product um, equals product ID. So we're going to send the product ID via product to the function in our class. OK, so now let's move over to the class. OK, so this is really simple. Um, so we're going to have a new function. We're going to call this um, delete. I think it was delete. Basket delete. Uh, yeah, basket dot delete. Uh, so we're going to call it delete. Uh, maybe you might want to call it remove. Um, I'm just going to call it delete for now. Uh, so let's um, go ahead and create a function for this. So what we need to do is um, we need to find the item within the basket and remove it from the basket. So we are bringing in product. So let's bring in product to this. So we've got the, the ID now. Um, so we can collect the ID. So um, this is going to be product uh, ID. So the product ID equals product. That's the data we've kind of moved into this function. Um, let's go ahead and just um, add some documentation. So this is going to be a delete item from session data. Okay. Uh, so now we've got that. So now what we need to do, obviously, is we need to find in our basket the ID, the product ID. So if the product ID, remember that's the ID that's stored in the product that we sent across via the button that's been pressed by the user. Um, so that's the product ID in self.basket. So if product ID in the basket, then obviously we're going to use this keyword delete del self dot basket uh, and then product ID. So that's what we need to actually delete product uh, ID from our data. Remember our data is kind of referred to as product ID. Um, that's kind of the keys um, product ID. That's how we're going to set out our data. So product ID. Um, so that's just understanding the structure of the data that we have inside of our session. And then we can go ahead and save it. So if you remember before, um, to save, um, we ran the self.session modified true. Now at this point, we've done this twice. We've used this same kind of function twice. So this is telling me in actual fact, this should be a separate function because there's no point in me kind of re uh, following the dry principles here, there's no point in me copying this out again, potentially, if I'm utilizing it more than once, I should make an, a separate function for this. I'm just going to, um, for now, just put it here, but maybe you want to create a new function uh, called save. And then what you might want then to do is just in that function, you're just going to basically run that command and obviously then that's going to run the save. So uh, you'll just simply put this in here like this. And then instead of running this command, or well, you're just going to call it self.save. So I've already done it. There we go. So let's, um, we might as well just finish this off um, wherever it was. There we go. There we go. Um, so that calls this uh, function here, which is obviously just going to save it every time. OK, so you would imagine at this point um, we have now updated our basket. So at this point is a rather dangerous spot. And I have paused here because maybe we can make the assumption that everything is OK. So there's a few mistakes that I've made. Um, and I want to say they're on purpose because these are kind of common mistakes to make and ones that would take a long time to fix normally because they're just not very obvious. So first of all, you'll notice that in the basket there, I made a typo here. I said is, if product ID is, but it should be in. 
So if you're following the code step by step, it should be in. So if product ID in self basket, we should perform an action. So um, I brought the, um, the the save, the forcing of the save, I want to tell Django that we've made a, a change in our session data. I brought that out of the if statement here. Um, but the most important thing here is that take, for example, this. So we know that the product information that we've sent in, um, we know the data that we've sent in here is the product ID. So let's just um, go back to our basket here. Let's just add something, load something into our basket, for example. So we've got something in a basket now. I press delete, I refresh, nothing happens. Okay, so what's happening here? So we can collect. Let's have a look. Let's um, collect the data that's in product um, ID. So if I use print here, what means as I can, when I reload the page and the code runs, that will appear here. So we're expecting to see the number here of this product, the ID of this product. So I press delete and you can now see that's product number one. That's what's printing out there in my console. So it looks okay. Um, product one is now being used here to, to run the deletion of that item in the session data, but it's just not working. And this is just one of those things that is going to cause you to spend a lot of time trying to work out what the problem is, um, but it's a simple one to fix. So further this along a little bit, you can see when I um, determine the type, so I use type here to determine the type of this data. And notice that when I run the data, you can see the outcome here, but I'll just run the data to show you again. So I run the data again, you can see that the class is in. So the data here is an integer. So what's being saved here in this product ID um, the data has been cast as an integer. Now that's okay. It seems okay. But the problem is that when we try and run against it against the data that's stored in the session data, this essentially is a string. Um, so we're trying to compare an integer with a string and that's not making the match. Um, so what we need to do is explicitly tell the product or define the product as a string. So we need to cast this integer as a string here, save it as a string, and then that can then be used to make the match in the basket and delete the item from the basket. So now when I go to my basket, press delete here, obviously I need to refresh still, the item disappears. So it looks like we've now got the delete function in place. So let's go ahead and just add some items, go to the basket, refresh. Okay, press delete. We need to sort that out in a second, refresh, and it's gone. So that brings us on to a final problem here. And you probably saw that when I add multiple items to the basket, what happens is that when I click on this button here, um, that would get deleted. But when I click here on the same page without refreshing at the moment, it won't get deleted. Because what's happening is that the delete buttons had the same ID in the background in the HTML. And we can't really have two buttons with the same ID. Java doesn't know which button to select. So all that happens is that the first item will get deleted, but the second item won't get deleted because it's still going to be utilizing data from that first item. So what we need to do here, uh, again, this is just jQuery here, um, and I'm just using jQuery just to quickly mock this up. Of course, you might use vanilla, vanilla JavaScript here, or you might bring in one of your favorite frameworks. So what you need to do here is Let's go into our summary. So the first thing is I'm going to keep the ID there, but I'm going to add the delete button class. So I'm going to identify the button initially by the delete button. Now what I can also do is add some data index. So this is the unique key um, that I'm going to pass over to Django. So data index product ID. So I'm going to collect that instead of collecting the value, which I previously set up. So now down here, then I've set that up. Uh, the setup is the same here. We've got the document on click, um, but this time the dot instead of the hash delete button to refer to a class and not an ID. And then here, how I'm actually collecting the data is I'm collecting it by that index I've created. So this dot data index. So that's detecting which button I'm selecting and then collecting that data index for that particular element. Okay. so. That's the deal there. So that's going to now work. So those are the changes that you need to make. And now I run a refresh. Let's just delete this and delete this and refresh. And we've deleted both items. 
Okay, so that was the next phase. That was the add in the delete button. Now we're gonna go ahead and create the Ajax to kind of delete the item from the page. So we've done the Ajax already. So what we need to do now is on return, um, once the data has been deleted, uh, we need to actually remove that element from the page so it instantly is removed. So let's remember that when we add an item to the shopping cart, when we press delete, it doesn't get updated straight away because we need to refresh. Remember the session data isn't being stored here on the front end. So we have to get the session data updated um, in order to render this page and then show it without this item. So we need to press delete and now use JavaScript to remove this item. So I'm gonna make a few changes here. First of all, I just need to collect or start uh, where the loop occurs. So let's first of all go into the, the right page, the summary. Yep, okay, so this is where the loop starts right here on uh, line 11. Now this is where the new item starts. So the element for the new item starts. What I've done here is I've added some more data index. Oh, sorry, I've added data index here and that will include the product ID. So that would be a data, piece of data that we can capture in a, in a minute through the parameter here, data index. So that would be one, two, ten, whatever the ID of that product, individual product is. And of course, I can then select this element and then delete the whole lot here. So that's why I'm adding it here. So I can delete the whole um, element from the page. Um, so I add that there for reference. Let's move down a little bit. So what I've done, um, you notice I used the data index before. So I'm just using it up the top there now. So let's move down. So what I'm going to do simply put is just remove that element. So what I need to do is I'm just going to record. So I'm going to make this new variable here uh, called project uh, product ID. That's going to equal this data index. Now that's going to collect the initially. Remember that's going to collect whatever button I pressed. That's going to get the ID of that particular button. And that's what we were using to actually then send across to the server in order to get that item uh, deleted before we started to do this um, automatically with Ajax, sorry, with JavaScript here to delete the item. So that will delete the item uh, initially. Okay, so what we've done now is we stored that ID here in this um, variable. So we come down here and I've added a new line of code here in this success. So let's go ahead and basically select the class of the main container for this product. So if I go up top here, I've added a new class here in the main container on line 11. So remember this is the div element that wraps around all of our product, individual product on the summary page, product summary page. So, sorry, the basket summary page. So that kind of ties that up nicely. Let's move back down. So now we've got the data index equals and then the ID. So we click the delete button, we get the ID, we store it in a variable. We go ahead and send that data to Django. We delete the item from the session. The session item deletes, it's successful. And then we select the product item container div or element um, where the data index equals whatever the item product item ID is and then we just remove it. So let's see this in action. So we're just gonna add an item now. We'll add, we'll add multiple items to show this works with multiple items. And then the React item. So we've got three items now in our basket. So I don't want this one here. I don't want this one here. And I don't want this one here. So I refresh the page. They are of course gone because the session has also been updated. And there we go, part two is now complete. We've uh, viewed all the items in the basket, we've set up the template, we've added a new delete button, we've created the Ajax to request uh, the deletion, and then we went into the basket class and we added a new function, a delete function, we've sorted all that out, and then we've gone ahead in that final step and removed the item from the basket using JavaScript. And of course, when we refresh the page, um, everything as is as it should be. So we're now on the final stretch, part three. So this shouldn't take as long, hopefully. Uh, so updating the data. So all we need to do now is send an update request uh, from our template using Ajax. 
and then we need to handle the update request. So essentially all we're doing is here is showing you an example where we're going to update the quantity within the basket so the user can add more or less. And then what we need to do is send that request to the server, handle that quantity request. So we're just gonna update the quantity information in that specific product. So we'll go ahead and handle those changes in the basket class. And then we just need to make sure that we then change the front end to correlate with the new changes that have been requested by the user. So let's start by heading over to the summary template. Now I'm just using this drop down here, this one to four. You might want to add more options or you might want to expand upon this slightly, maybe follow what Amazon does in their basket by it allows the user to select a certain amount and then they can then input their own value if they want to. So you can expand it if you like in that way. Now we've got this button here. This is the update button. I changed the name add to update because that was incorrect. So the current um, situation is we've got an update button, has a value of the product ID, which will probably be useful. Uh, so we need to select this button. Now, again, this is gonna be a multiple button option because there's gonna be multiple products on this page. So what we're gonna need to do here is we're going to need to uh, set out our data. Let's just set out our data index and as a product ID. And then we're also going to include a new class here called update button. So I guarantee someone will have problems here when they're working with Ajax and then they ask in the chat that, or they're telling the chat it's not working. Really this code is working here. Um, so it's just going to be a typo error. There's just going to be something really small. Like it looks like I've got an error now, for example, it's just a typo error. There's a double, oh, excuse me. There's a, there's a double missing here and that's affecting the code. Now utilizing a program such as Visual Studio Code it does highlight. So you can see that this is all green indicating there is a problem somewhere along this line potentially that's the problem. Uh, in this case, it's a double, not a singles double double not a, a single double even so just double check the code against the code repository before you ask the question and then when you do ask a question if you do ask a question in the comments trying to be a little bit more expansive don't just say it's not working I have no idea why it's not working if you just tell me that so try and be a little bit more expansive with this problem that you're having so now we've configured the template in preparation to collect the data um, I just wanted to do one more thing and let's have a look at the select here. We're going to uniquely identify the select item based upon, uh, sorry, you tonight, we need to be able to select the individual select items from each, um, product. So the way that we can do that, there are many ways, of course, is that I've gone ahead and created the select option and I've added the product ID after the word select. So each select drop down here has a unique select element name ID. Um, so this quantity here, for example, inspect, sorry, uh, yeah, if we go to inspect, I'm not too sure why that's not working. Bear with me. There we go. So there you can see it says select three and this one here says select one. So this whole kind of box here can be captured uh, and the data inside can be captured nice and easily by doing that, of course. So we've gone ahead and done that. So we'll create this unique ID for the select field and that will allow me to select the individual items. So let's go down now. I've gone ahead already and I've got the delete item section. I've copied that down. So we just, we could put this in the same area here. We could perform the same functions with a few if statements, etc. Um, save us having to copy some of the code down, but I'm just going to, for simplicity, simplicity, just copy and paste this into a new section here called update item. So if you take a read through this, there's some uh, few changes. We've updated the update button um, class. That's the class for the update button, of course. And then we've kept in collecting the product ID from the button when the button is pressed. But this time you can see we're gonna send across the ID as we did previously, but also we're gonna select the product quantity. So we're gonna get the ID select plus 
the product ID number, that select one, select two, select three, whatever the ID is. So that uniquely identifies that ID for that drop down select box. And then we select the option within the select box, the selected item, and that's going to be text. So we get the amount of items that the user is selecting and we save it right there. So we've done that. We've then created a URL for this. Uh, so update path update slash views basket update. So we're just copying this down instead of delete, it's going to say update. And then we move into the views. We're going to pass the data across to the view here. And you can see I've already gone ahead and created this view. It's very similar to the previous previous views. You can see how some of this code, um, not necessarily following dry principles here, you may want to kind of encapsulate all of these into one path in actual fact, and then utilize the action here to change the action um, so that it performs a different action within the one function if you're going to build this in one function. So if request post get action equals post, we're going to get the ID from the Ajax data request and the quantity. So we pass over the ID and the quantity. Now I've just selected print here and then the ID and the quantity just to show you to see if that works. So I'm going to click on update and then I'm going to have a look. Of course, in my terminal, you can see that I'm printing out one and four. So I selected four. So let's just try two and update. Uh, so again, so this is product ID one and I've selected two items. So you can see now that everything is in place nicely. So I just need to send this across now into my basket class and deal with changing the data within my session data. So let's go ahead now and create a new function within our basket class. We're going to call this update. So we're going to need to pass in the product ID and also the product quantity. So that's going to equal the product. Oh, sorry, let's just um, let's uh, copy that. One second. Let's just call that quantity. So we're going to pass in quantity and product. <laughs> okay. So over here then in our basket class, let's create a new function called update. Now we're going to need to bring in the product and the quantity, quantity of course, and also self. Okay, so we bring those values in and now we need to deal or do something with this. So um, let's just uh, create some documentation. So this is going to be update values in session data. Okay, so I guess all we need to do here is um, select select the uh, data within the session that matches the um, product ID and then change the quantity. So I guess what we need to do here is, now this is the actual ID, remember, and not the actual product data uh, from the database. So we're going to say that product ID is going to equal product. Okay, and then quantity, we might as well do this, quantity product uh, or quantity uh, equals, well, quantity. We don't have to do that necessarily, um, but just uh, lays it out there for us. So we've got these two parameters, right? So now let's uh, think about how to do this. So um, we're going to say, if, for example, if the product is similar to what we've done previously, checking if product ID um, not not in self dot basket. So we're going to check first to see if the uh, product ID is in the basket. So I guess what we could do, um, thinking about this, is why I've written this is because you can see potentially this is what we've done to add items. 
here. And then we've added an item. So potentially way we could include this update is within, the, within this add function here. Um, so we could add an extra kind of parameter here where, where we could um, say, for example, update equals true. So we could send in here true or false. So if we were sending an update request, um, this would be true, for example. So we'll probably start with false, sorry. And we could essentially then create an if statement within here. If the update equals true, then run these commands. If it equals false, then we're just going to add a product. So we could definitely work in that way. I'm just trying to simplify this slightly by creating a new function here. So if product ID in basket, so if we can find the product in the basket, and it should be in the basket because we're actually in the basket area or template uh, while we're doing this. Um, so if it is in the, in there, then obviously we're going to perform an action. So what we're going to do is self dot basket, and we're just going to override the where the product ID is the product ID, and obviously what we want to override in this case is the quantity within our data, and that's going to equal um that's going to equal our quantity now of course i can just remove that so it's just going to equal our, our new quantity right um now the thing is here we need to kind of maybe make a decision um uh, or you need to make a decision here how you want this to work because maybe you start with two products and you want to add one more in which case you need to make a calculation or is it a simple case you just want the, the person to select the amount in general you know one four six two and then update so i suppose we could um make a decision there exactly what we want to do i suppose there's a few things that we could do there but that seems like a, a good place to start um, we're going to get the product from the basket via the product item and then update the quantity with the new quantity that we passed in let's not forget to obviously save this so self.save there we go that's obviously going to run the session modified true okay so just to test to make sure you're still awake uh, this is fairly long i do apologize for the length of this hopefully it was useful uh, making it this long uh, be good to get your comments and feedback if this is useful the level of detail within the tutorial now, if you remember last time, um, well, first of all, there's there's no semicolon here. Um, so if you remember last time, we had to deal with the product information because it's an integer and we couldn't compare that with um, to the basket data. So we had to turn this into a string or cast this into a string here. So, and the product needs to be cast into a string and then now we can make that match. So let's go into our basket. Let's update this to one update obviously we need to refresh there we go so it looks like it's updating so let's update that to three let's update that to three we'll update that update that refresh there we go so you can see that we've got multiple updates um and also when we refresh obviously the price is changing too the subtotal i believe is changing let's try one more time there we go so everything is now working that's pretty much it the last thing that we need to do is just update this so that when we do select a new item and press update, it just automatically updates without the refresh. Of course, we also need to deal with the basket as well. That's something else that we need to update. So at this point, there's no need for us to actually send the item ID and the product quantity back to the front end once we've done an update because we already know that information. Um, we can collect that information via um, JavaScript on the front end. Now, what we do want to collect and send back Obviously, we want to make the calculation for the new total. So that's definitely something that we want to um, look to send back. And then potentially, depending on how you work here, I've got the actual kind of subtotals of the quantity here. So potentially, we also need to calculate that and return that value to update that too. Now, for simplicity, I am going to remove um, these items here and just put in the actual price of an individual product. I'm just going to show you how to update these total, the quantities 
and the item here is in the basket. So just reverting back on line 21 of the summary HTML page, I'm just going to turn that back into the product price. Okay, so going back onto my template, I've just got the original prices of these items. Now, please go ahead and challenge yourself to update these two. It isn't too difficult. I just wanted to make sure that this tutorial doesn't go on for too much longer. Okay, so let's now update these items. So first of all, we're going to have a look in the basket here. We've already created a function here for getting the total price. So we would imagine that in the view here, we can just call that similar to what we've done up here. And then, uh, well, um, we can return the basket quantity like we did before. And now we can also have the basket, uh, for example, total. That's going to equal basket uh, dot, oh, and then the name here, get total price. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so that will then allow us to kind of return the um, information we need. So we can obviously test at any time if you're not too sure, just uh, maybe just print the value out if you don't think you're getting the right value, for example. So what you can now do, I just go in, refresh, um, do an update, that should trigger the code, right? And then have a look in your, um, in your terminal. You can see it's printing out 69.95 as the new total. So it looks like it's um, capturing that okay. So let's go ahead now and we're just going to send that back. So we're going to send the quantity back to the front end, the new quantity, whatever that is. And then also we want the uh, the total. So I'm just going to call this uh, total and that's going to equal the basket total. Okay, so now then, let's just quickly go back to the views. I've had a little break. I've come back. I've changed the basket total uh, reference to subtotal. Now, remember, remember, subtotal is obviously the not the final total total because you might have, for example, shipping, etc. So subtotal be in the current total at the moment with the quantity of books. Um, obviously, we might want to add coupons, etc., and then show the final total, of course. So, yep, so just to recap then, uh, we're going to reference this data. We've sent it, we've got the basket quantity in the total, and now we're going to send that back, that new data back to the front end. So let's go back to the front end here. And in the summary, basket summary, we now have, um, we're now running, returning that data into JSON, um, returning that data from the view and reference, referencing to it via the JSON word here. We can change that word, of course, if we want to. So what we're doing here is we're going to get the element by ID, so basket quantity. So let's go into uh, the base. Remember that the basket quantity is what we were using to change the quantity of the basket, if I can remember. Um, total quantity, so ID basket quantity. So we're just updating this total here. So that's what we're doing, step number one. So that's going to do that. And then secondly, we just want to update the subtotal. So obviously what we've done here is we've just created a new div here so we can kind of wrap the data in this div. Now we are using D in line flex, so it runs in line with the other div, um, the outer div there. So ID subtotal. So we're just going to replace that total with a new value. So again, same kind of command here, document .get element by ID. So we get the element by ID, and then inside of the element, we then add the JSON, referencing the data, and then the subtotal that we've returned from the view. Of course, remember, uh, this is the data. This is the reference to that data that we're passing over to the template. So that's how we're accessing the data. Okay, so finally then, let's have a look. Uh, so let's just add some, all the items to the basket. There we go. So we now have three items. Wonderful. So we've got 4797. That's the total of those three times one quantity each. So let's just update this quantity. It should update the basket to four. Okay. 
and then you can see that the total is also updated so let's update double this you can see that the subtotal is updated the basket is updated well let's just delete this now so um, now we've deleted this item you can see that we also now need to change the subtotal when we delete items so in fact that's another task that we now need to complete so we'll do that but uh, remember obviously once you refresh it, um, obviously that data is going to be correct because we we're updating the session data of course uh, so let's just go back now and into our views um, so the delete uh, so we want to return then uh, so we what we want to do is get the total basket quantity after we run the deletion uh, so we'll delete and then let's get the total basket and let's uh, actually then now use the response to send that data back so when we delete from the basket um yep so we're just going to need the the subtotal so let's pass over the subtotal there so let's go back into the summary now and we're just going to grab this piece of code that we're using go over to the delete item script here and so one thing we want to do is remove an item and then we want to go ahead and access the id element by id and then just change the subtotal so that was fairly simple so that should now work so let's just try this um, so if i change this to one update this so that's a yeah, that's 35 pound, 36 pound 98. So if I remove this, you can now see that the subtotal does not get updated. Okay, potential problem then. Right, so and we removed and we get the subtotal dot inner. So we're on the same page. Okay, so what is happening here? So let's go back into our view. So basket, uh, subtotal basket. So we're not sending response. Well, we are sending response so subtotal basket total so we're getting the basket total price so hmm, interesting wonder what the issue is so i promise i've done absolutely nothing here um so let's go back to let's go back to django um I've add to basket so i've just gone and added some more items to the basket so it's updating the basket um, so I refresh, I delete this item and you can see that the subtotal is changing. So not entirely sure what would happen there, but it is working okay. But I've also noticed now that the basket is incorrect when we delete items. So in actual fact, what we're going to need to do is also send back when we delete items, uh, we're going to also need to update the quantity, the basket quantity. So let's go back into our view and then obviously we're just going to um, calculate our basket again and send that across so we're going to delete the item get the basket total and get the quantity sorry get the total and then respond so it's the same piece of code again so clearly here this is a good uh, indication um, that potentially these two items here could be somehow probably merged in some respects um, because we've got a lot of repeated data uh, repeated code here um, so yeah there's definitely some refactoring there i think that we can think about so let's just try this now um, so let's uh start from fresh let's go through the emotions here so the application cookie just going to clear that so we've got nothing in our shopping cart let's go back to the front end let's just add so it does work if I keep adding. You can see it um, will uh, think about updating. Um, but at the same time, potentially there's an, an issue there that needs resolving. Because the quantity isn't, when we add to the basket, potentially we need to, we need to sort that. Um, so it looks like there's a problem there, in actual fact. So uh, let's go back to this. Um, so we've got Django for beginners. Uh, so we put that in the basket so uh, let's um update this book by yeah, let's just update it okay so that updates that looks okay uh, so we we'll delete it and now we just have one item and then let's just add another item again just to double check this now 
four. Let's update. So we've got five. So four of those, one of those. Delete that. So we should have four. Four times 1099. Okay, so that looks okay. So everything is looking all right at the moment uh, with the deletion and also the updating. Okay, so I think we're just about there. Uh, we've updated. We've We've updated the data now. We've gone through the emotions very briefly. Uh, so we've sent an update request from Ajax. We've handled the updates. We've changed the front end data, uh, the price and the quantity. So we've gone through that. So I think there is uh, one little issue um, still. And that is, I think we just saw that when we go into the product, for example, and then we add the quantity. So we've got one. Let's add that to a basket. So now we've got two. Let's refresh. We have two items. So you can see that, um, okay, let's, let's add the intermediate, add three. So we've got one of each now. Okay, so let's add um, three. So that gives us six. If we add it again, it now gives us eight. So notice what's happened there is that I've selected three items to add. It's calculated six. And then I've added to the basket again. Now it says eight, strangely. And when I refresh, I have five. So it's a little bit peculiar. Uh, so give me a few minutes. I'll have a little look at this and I'll come back and see what the problem is. Okay, so I had a look around and I saw a mistake in the code. So you saw earlier that when we added items here, the quantity and updated the basket to see if we can just add different quantities, for example. The numbering system didn't quite work out. And that was because of, remember I mentioned this common error that can occur when we don't use the right data types. Um, so for example here, what was happening, this is in the add function here. Um, I was running the pro if product ID in self basket and I wasn't actually utilizing um, was it wasn't actually checking because it wasn't the product ID wasn't a string to actually check the session data. So what I've done here, this is in the add function here. Just for now, we've gone ahead and added this if statement. So if the product ID is in the basket, so if the item is already in the basket, we're just going to update the quantity. So get the basket by product ID and then get the quantity data and override it with the new quantity. And then that will calculate correctly. Now, if, for example, we don't have the item in the basket, well, it's just going to go ahead and add it to the basket and then save it. So that was the problem. I also want to apologize. I think I kept on saying the wrong terminology earlier, um, talking about libraries um, when I meant dictionaries. Um, I do apologize for that. I was just thinking about that. Um, talking, looking, thinking, uh, what's going on, and um, recording and thinking about what I'm saying again. Um, it's, it's all too much for my brain sometimes. So I do apologize if I've used the wrong terminology um, a few times in this tutorial. Okay, so let's just go ahead now one more time and check all of this. So of course we're gonna go through testing, but we may as well do some user testing here. So let's uh, refresh. Oh, I don't know what's happened there. I didn't delete that, okay. That is very strange. We've now got this problem. Uh, so I just clear this, refresh, go to the bookstore. Okay. Okay, right. So we start from fresh. Let's add a product here, add the quantity one, uh, add some of this. And we just add the last item in. Just have a little play around. So one, so that should increment by one now. It does, should increment by one more. There we go. So. The quantity is updating properly now how I want it. Of course, you might change this. You might infer that the fact that we ask for four and press add basket, you might want four more. Of course, this numbering system you might include in a different way. You might have an input so users can add items manually, of course. So this is uh, something that you can definitely change, but it looks like that's okay. So let's go over here. We've got six items, four, five, six. Looks like it's tight and uh, working properly. Update that. Uh, so the basket is updating properly. The number values there for, um, and we're deleting items and it looks like we're okay with that. So there we go. I think we've um, got to the end now of this code. So we've now completed the update 
task. Now there is, I can already see some kind of refactoring here of the code that we can perform. Um, it does look like the ad is kind of leaking into the update a little bit. Um, you've kind of seen that. So potentially there's room there to maneuver that code into one function, for example. Um, but that's something that maybe you can have a look at. Um, maybe I'll tackle this in the next tutorial, just go through like I did in this tutorial, optional kind of step, just refactoring some of this code. So I do hope you've enjoyed this small development. It has gone on for quite a long time. Um, and I try to be as detailed as possible. I apologize again for some of the terminology. Um, again, I was talking about earlier, possibly I've made a mistake there. Um, but hopefully you've got the general idea now of what is going on and how to handle CRUD with sessions. So now we need to test our application. Now, in comparison to the previous tests that we performed, there are probably two new parameters we need to think about here within our tests. So just thinking about the new features that we've added to our application, that's essentially sessions and the Ajax requests that we've sent to our views. So there's probably two things here that we need to manage and uh, think about when we're building these tests for our basket. So it is always recommended to maybe build the test before we build the application or potentially build the test directly after we built those small components. So in this application, we built the add, delete, update, those kind of core sections of our basket or core components of our basket. So we could have tested after those phases. So purely just to focus on the development in this tutorial, we didn't perform any testing. So let's start our testing by just testing everything again. Uh, let's just make sure it all works. So you can see that we have an error in our tests. So this is caused due to the fact that we're now using sessions. So let's just go down. Um, you may have a slightly different code than that. I've been playing with this code. Um, so you can see here in the store and tests, test views, we have this factory request here. <coughs> Sorry, this, um, this factory test here. So we are just testing to make sure that we can access the page, um, the products all request. So we're just testing to make sure that we can access um, the home page here. Um, and then we're going to just check the HTML. So that was what we previously completed in the last tutorial. Now I'm just going to remove this factory for now because the previous te test here is doing exactly the same thing. Um, and that's maybe something we can bring back in later. So I'm just going to remove the factory element. So from my tests, there we go. So let's go back to, to down to the bottom here. Now, let me just uh, remove these uh, these two lines of code here. So this is what you're looking at potentially um, if you're following the code. So if I run the test now, what happens is that potentially we receive an error, HTTP request object has no attribute session. So now because our application is, in general terms, now because our application is using sessions, the HTTP request is looking for the session attribute or is expecting the session attribute. So we need some way of um, simulating and being able to start or capture or um, create that parameter so that we can then access our pages um, and test our application. So here, um, what you're looking at here is a simple um, HTML response uh, for, it looks like the, the home page products all. Um, so we're just sending a request here, it looks like to the home page. And then we're just running some simple tests here to uh, have a look into the HTML and look for the title to make sure that matches the right title. It looks like we looked at the start of that HTML page and to make sure the doc type was in place. And then we also checked to make sure the response code was 200 and that confirmed our page was working correctly. So now we need a way of um, also referencing that session attribute here so that we can actually perform this test. So what we've done is we've gone ahead and from the import lib, we've imported the import module. So that allows us to essentially, in general terms, um, bring in the session engine, which would then allow us to kind of start or simulate within the request a new session. So these two lines of codes there is performing that. So now we've done that, that will then 
allow us just to run that test and we should have kind of full um, test coverage as oh, no, it looks like we've uh, failed here. So in actual fact, that's the expected outcome because if we read through here, the title should be store and not stores. So if we change that, that's what the title is on the home page, the products all page. So let's go back and run that test and we're all good. So that solves that page. So now we need to think about the testing for our basket. So let's go into our basket, uh, create a new folder called tests, and make sure you've got the init py um, file so that Python can see this folder or view items within it. And then let's go over and create a new file here called test underscore views. Right, so let's, um, let's run coverage, and that's gonna give us an indication of what it is that we are going to need so let's run test now if we did run this remember that if we run this test here it's also going to have a look in our vent folder so let's remember to use the omit and the event folder and then manage tests so let's go ahead and run that so we run some tests obviously it's working okay so now we can run the coverage html and have a look so if you've forgotten, just remember, if you go into the product folder, we've now got the HTML cov folder. Inside of that, we've got the index. So we can just run that. That will run the coverage report or give us the coverage report. So you can see here that we've got potentially 28 missing tests in our views and 25 in our basket. That's the basket views and the basket uh, class, it looks like. Now, before you start worrying about another 10 hours of testing here, um, that isn't going to equate to 28 tests needed there and 25 tests needed here. Um, we can run some tests that will perform actions on the view and the basket, because remember they are tied together. Um, they, require, they require each other to work. So there isn't too much testing that we need to potentially do here to satisfy these missing tests. So everything else is just as it was. So let's go ahead now and see if we can run some tests. Now we can just go into the views and you can see here that essentially we need to run a test for each of these functions here. Now, like I was saying, if we, if we run a test on those functions, it utilizes the basket class and we'll be utilizing and testing for all of this here. Now there's one thing that we need to remember that uh, inside of our add, I think it is, uh, yeah, inside of our ad here, we've got an if else statement. So we need to test or create two tests here potentially um, to satisfy both of those outcomes. Okay then, so from the top in our testing views page, so here we are in our tests, in our basket, our test view page here. So uh, let's go ahead now and let's bring in the user because we're gonna need to make some data here. So remember, we are copying the Django database, um, our products database, making a copy of that and also the user database. So we're gonna to need to add some data into that in order for us to, when we build the session, there's gonna to need to be data, remember, because in our basket class, we do have a look for the product data and try and extract it from the database. So we're gonna need that database. Um, so let's bring in test case and we're gonna need to reverse. So we're gonna make dynamic links here. We're not gonna type in the slash uh, basket slash add etc or we'll use the dynamic link using reverse and then we go in and also from store we've imported models so the category in the product model so we add some data for that okay so i've just called these tests test basket view um, so these are tests that are related to testing um, the view functionality and then obviously that's connected to the basket class of course right so um, I'm going to have a little bit of a setup here. So we're going to need to, like we did previously in our tests, go ahead and create some data for our, our user. So we add a new user into the user table, user objects, and then we make a new category so that we can add some products. So we add a new category. And I'm going to make a few products here. So this is just code from the previous um, test. That's why I'm just uh, copy and pasting this in. Uh, products, objects, create. So another... Um, another product. So I've created three products. Now I appreciate that I can make one three products in one statement, um, but I've made three products here 
and you can see that the slightly different advanced intermediate and beginners they've all got the same price of 20 pounds or 20 dollars or whatever it is okay so they've all got the same slug as well that isn't really an issue or something that i'm testing at this point um so let's move on and then now what i'm doing is i'm going to send a client post um so what i'm doing here is i'm going to build uh some session data so i've added two items to the session here so you can see uh, self.client post add i've sent this to basket add and i've added um, some products now notice i'll explain this in a second xhr when we get to it uh, but that's just basically some data that i've added here and now essentially what's happening there is i'm actually running a test almost because if that if my program doesn't work that is not going to work so um i've already tested this out and it actually works and so i've kind of set up my data that way because it makes the test look nicer but i can also put this data in the test if i wanted to okay so that adds some data to the session so that we can perform the update and delete so let's go ahead now and create our first test so we just start off with a simple uh, URL test here, the basket. Um, so we're going to use the um, client this time. So I did have a question about um, do I need to bring in client into the test uh, from the community? No, we don't need to anymore. So self.client.get. Um, we don't need to actually import the client. Um, so get reverse. So I'm using reverse here to build the basket summary link. Now remember what's going to happen there is it's going to look for the basket URLs using the namespace and then look for the basket summary where the URL. So if I go into apologies to make this explicit. So in basket and then I'm referencing basket summary in order to get this URL here and Django is going to then provide that for us. So that's the reverse and then we then check this response code 200 that's obviously the okay response http okay response and then that's the first test completed so the second test we're going to now test to see if we can add items to our basket now obviously we've tried to do it here already so uh, let's go ahead and do that so let's add some items to our basket uh, so what we're doing here is we're just getting the reverse of the basket add we're using self client post to post some data now um, you can see that the data that we're going to test now this needs to match what's in the front end so if you're not too sure what i've done is i've had a look at the front end so i've gone into my views um so so this is the this is the post now this is done from in actual fact if we go into the templates that's done from the products single this is where we add items if you remember so down here you can see in my um in my script here i'm sending across the quantity and the id so i need to make sure that matches up but one other thing that needs to be sent across because remember we run the if statement to check to see if this is being sent the action so this is another parameter that we've sent across so that's something else that we need to set up uh, so you can see here we're sending across the product id product quantity and the action equals post so that's the data here in the middle and at the end here, we're just specifying what type of um, request we're sending, XHR. So if we go into here, what does XHR mean? So this is the XML HTTP request. So when we use AJAX, uh, in general terms, we are sending an XML HTTP request. So we're just basically um, telling or setting that up in the request so it can be sent across and we can simulate that action of sending a, an ajax request from our front end so let's go back so that's why we have that at the end that's kind of a shorthand for doing that if you look at other examples online you can expand that to the full uh, description but that's just kind of a shorthand way of doing it so we've now sent data to our application um so you would imagine at this point our our view would handle that information bring in the basket class uh, perform the action of adding that to our to our session and now we can test to see um, what is returned now if you remember we just need to follow our program here 
Um, so we've added, then we've returned the response to the quantity. That's what we've returned. So we now get the quantity of everything that's in the basket. So let's go back to our test here. Now notice here what we've done is we've added product ID three. Now this needs to be here. This is why I've added three products here. So this is referring to this product here, uh, product ID three, and then quantity one. Now what we need to do and remember is that in the startup or the setup code, I added two items, but notice that I added one of these and two of these. So two plus one plus one is four, obviously. So what I'm expecting to return is quantity four, and that's the amount of products I have in my basket. So hopefully that makes sense. By understanding your code here, it's a lot easier to potentially understand what is what you're trying to test. So I am using this code. I'm using a test database, but I'm using this code here um, when I run these tests to perform the actions because we're testing this code, of course. Okay, so hopefully that is making sense what's going on there. So let's go over to our next test. Oh, sorry. Um, so we set up the, um, looks like we've added a, another item here. So this time, um, notice what we've done here is that inside of our, on our add, inside of our basket class, sorry, we've got two options. We have an if and an else. So if in our, let's bring this open, in our basket, basket, inside of here, we have the add up here. So if the product ID um, is already in the basket, we just update the quantity. So let's look in here. So notice that this time, the second test I'm running, I'm, I'm entering product ID two. Now product ID already exists inside of our session. So all that's going to happen is it's just going to update the quantity. So this time it should return now quantity three. So why three and not four? That's an interesting question. So to try and understand what's going on here, sorry, um, this time we're removing one of the product quantities or so we're removing the or changing the product quantity. So this now becomes one. So what we have in our session now is one plus one uh, plus the one we've just added. So the quantity now should return three. So that just stimulates and checks to see if we can change uh, the quantity and it checks to make sure that this if statement is working correctly. Okay, so now we can move on to the deletion. So again, just understand what we're doing here um, in our actual code. Um, so the deletion, apologies, let me just uh, open up the, the view for our basket. So in our delete here, you can see that we're expecting to be sent the product ID only and then we return the basket quantity in the basket total. So that's what we're testing here. So let's go ahead and do that. So uh, we create our um, response. So we're posting here to the basket delete and then product ID two action post. So we've sent across our request here and then what gets returned. So we're capturing the quantity and the subtotal. Now remember this is a separate test here. So all this data would have been forgotten. So what we've done is we've deleted product ID two. So remember, this is the data that we've inserted in every single test. We're going to run this data. So in actual fact, we've removed, it looks like we've deleted, what have we deleted? We, we've deleted product ID two. So in actual fact, we've deleted this. And now that leaves us with one product in our session, in our basket. So that's ID, so that's quantity one. Now we know that this is ID one which represents 20 pounds or $20 or whatever, 20. So what should get returned now is 20 because we have one item in our basket because we've removed one and it costs 20. Right, so that's that test done, just testing the deletion. And now let's test the update. So this time, have a look in our view again. Um, we're sending the ID and the quantity and we're returning the basket quantity and the basket total. So let's tie that. So we're going to send the product ID. Don't forget the action as well as always needed product quantity. 
So this is product um, updating here. So we're just updating uh, the product quantity um, from two to one. So remember product ID two has two initially. So we want to update it and now it only has one item. Uh, so we just test that out. So what we have now is there's two items with a subtotal of 40. Okay, so there's two, the quantity of two, yep, because we've uh, removed one. So we've removed one, so we have one and one. And then obviously both of these products together, they both cost $20 or 20 pounds. So the subtotal currently is 40 in our basket. Okay, I hope that, that, hope that is easy to follow. Um, there we go. That's all the tests I think we need to do to satisfy the coverage. So let's go ahead and run our coverage again. Oh, and then coverage HTML to update our coverage HTML. Let's go back into our report, refresh, and there we go. It looks like we've got 100% coverage. So because we're using coverage, it doesn't mean that that's all the tests that we might want to do or perform. But um, just following this coverage, it does look like we've covered most of the uh, logic within our application that requires testing. Excellent. So finally, we've got to the end. Hopefully that was useful for you. Uh, I do apologize if it was a bit waffly. If you have got to the end, I'm really thankful for that. Thank you for watching all of that. Um, your feedback is, is really important to try and make these videos much better. Uh, for everyone. Um, so thinking about part three then moving forward, in the next component we are going to be building the payment system so we can actually take payments for our store and then we think about users, uh, we, maybe we think about some automation so that when the user purchases a product we need to kind of send them an email so we need to potentially automate that. Um, so there's lots of things that we could do, it's probably going to be another big session um, so thank you very much again for listening and I hope you enjoyed the tutorial and I'll see you in the next one.